Rocky Mountain air smells a lot like freedom. Northwest Liberty News. And I know that most all of you are great patriots. And I think you're, uh, the only thing I would ask you to do as we go through this today, that you uh, approach it with an open mind. So you know the mind is like a parachute. It only, opens, it only works when it's open. And so there's, <laughs> you're going to hear some things that you've probably never heard before, but you need to understand them because they, they've always been in it. And we need to understand our rights or we don't have them. So without going on and on, you don't want to hear me anyway. Mm -hmm. Let me introduce you, Ron. Can everybody hear me all right? I want to ask if you have a cell phone, please turn it off for consideration of everybody else here. If you need to turn it on, you know, vibrate or whatever the thing. And if you have a call you need to take, then please exit quietly as you can. This is for consideration of everybody else that's here. Uh, first off, good morning. Good morning. That's pathetic. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. I, uh, I want to say what an honor it is to be here to share with you a very, a very important subject matter. Uh, thank you all for coming out. I know this is a Saturday. I know that it costs some money to come to this. But at the end of the day, my prayer is that you would, in fact, understand and be glad that you came. That's my goal. Uh, <clears throat> before we get started, uh, if you would indulge me a little bit of a sidebar issue here. How many veterans do we have here? Would you please stand? <clears throat> Would you please stand? And I want to say to all of you, you're my heroes. And let's give them a hand, okay? I had a thing in my file that I wanted to share with you. It is, it is the veteran, not the preacher, who gives us the freedom of religion. It is the veteran and not the reporter that gives us the freedom of the press. It is the veteran, not the poet, who gives us the freedom of speech. It is the veteran, not the campus organizer, who has given us the freedom to assemble. It is the veteran, not the judge, who has given us the right to a fair trial. It is the veteran, not the policeman, who has given us the right to vote. It is the veteran who gave us the right to salute our flag. It is the veteran who serves under that flag so that we may have freedom. One day a young boy came to his grandfather who was sitting on his porch on the farm. And the young boy looked up at Grandpa and he said, Grandpa, he said, were you in the war? And Grandpa said, yeah, I was. And the young boy asked him, he said, Grandpa, were you a hero? He said, no. But everyone else in my own house. I love that. Okay, I want to digress a little bit. I'd like to take a few minutes <clears throat> to tell you about Ron Gibson. I'm not here to toot my horn. I'm not here to show off to anybody. I'm here because I care. And I care about our country, I care about our rights, and I care about our people who are being led down a dead-end street. And so I want to give you a little background. <clears throat> I grew up on a ranch in southern Oregon. My dad was a cattle rancher, raised cattle and horses and hay, and I learned to work. My mother and my dad uh, were staunch constitutionalists. They believed in the principle of that, and the very fact that I had those roots instilled a desire in my heart 
to continue the furtherance of the education of what our Constitution is and means. And I want to clarify something. The Constitution gives you not one single right. People go, you're kidding me. No, I'm not kidding you. Our Constitution reaffirms your inalienable rights. In other words, your inalienable rights are God-given. You and I are a product of our Creator. That's why you're sovereign. And it makes me mad as hell when I see these politicians and all of these groups that claim in those sovereigns that were domestic terrorists. And when we get into the subject matter today, you're going to want to be a sovereign. And you're going to want to claim a sovereign. <clears throat> because without sovereign rights, you have no rights. Okay? And I think everybody in this room can testify to the fact that there's something dreadfully wrong in our nation. And not just here, but around the world. And one of those elements that we deal with is our land. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit. But I want to share a little bit with you about my background. As I shared, I grew up on a ranch, learned to work hard. My dad used to point his finger, not at me, but up. It signified a number of things. Pay attention. And number two, wisdom comes from there. And he said, Butch, that was my nickname. He said, whatever you do in life, he said, do what's right. He said, never mind about being right. He said, just do what's right. And he said, if you'll do what's right, that usually, in most instances, takes care of who's right. And I have found that to be true in all of my 67 years of life. I went to a little four-room school, brick uh, grade school, had two classes in each room. It's a historic building today. I guess maybe I'm historic too. <laughs> but... Uh, <clears throat> We produced a number of valedictorians out of that little country school, and I'm proud to have gone there. <clears throat> I went to Grants Pass High School, graduated in 1965, and then from there I went to become an optometrist, or wanted to become an optometrist. And Pacific University at Forest School in Oregon is a private school, and nobody told me, so I drove all the way up there to register and the registrar's office looked at me and said, no. I said, why not? He said, because there's a two-year waiting list to get into that school. I said, oh, my. So that kind of dumped that in the toilet. <clears throat> so then I decided that I'd go to engineering school, and so I went to engineering school. My secondary studies was constitutional law, and I love it. And I love constitutional law because it's based upon this book. It's called the Bible. And from this book, we've derived our forefathers with this book. You with me? One of the tragic things that we have allowed to happen in our country is that we have lost our honor. <clears throat> and I use the analogy that some people go to church and the person next to you will pray for you on Sunday and they will pray upon you come Monday. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. And my Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and confess their sin and seek my face, I will hear from them from heaven and I will heal your land. Amen. I see people move into town, build an eight foot fence because they don't want to see the neighbor and they don't want to see the neighbor to see them. If you really stop there, it's kind of sick. 
Because the Bible tells us that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we have a very gross misunderstanding about the word love. We think it's all mushy and the feeling. It isn't that at all. Not that it can't be a part of that. Don't misunderstand me. But to love your neighbor means that if he has need, you move in and you help him. And you do everything you can without demanding something in return. Breaks my heart. In law school, we would do what's called mock trials. And it's amazing how a case can get manipulated. And in administrative law, I, I'm schooled in constitutional law, not administrative law. I deal with it a lot, but that's not my training. And in that training, it shows you how easy and how subtle and how manipulative your rights can be taken from you. I never forgot it. And I vowed that if I had the opportunity to share with people, that I would try to remember and encourage them to make sure that you maintain your rights. And the way you do that is helping your neighbor and help him to maintain his, to help him if he has need. And so then I joined the Marine Corps. I was not the drafted. I wanted to serve my country. I spent four years in the Marine Corps and spent my tour in Vietnam. I was involved in some of the heaviest fighting in Vietnam at the time. Seen a lot of death in my life. Last nine months in the Marine Corps, I was selected to be a body escort. Some of you may know what that is, some may not. I brought home dead bodies to the family. Doesn't get any tougher than that except for the families. And I learned something else about that too, that the price of freedom is a tremendous price that's paid for. And one of the elements that God has given us, and that is the element of land, land ownership. And in my book, I address the issue of where the concept and the principle of land ownership comes from. And it comes from that book by Almighty God. It goes clear back to the first part of Genesis. And if you look in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 21, in the middle of that, God said, I will give my people the land and they will possess it forever. And as we get into land patents in the class here today, I'm going to show you, and maybe some of you know, maybe a lot of you do not, that that phrase in the land patent came from Isaiah chapter 60, verse 21. In other words, God is saying, I want you to have your own land. I want you to own your own land. And I want you to have peace and serenity there. That's what a home in your land is to be. Not just for production, not just this or that. When you read scripture, and I'm an avid student of my Bible, I don't know it all, I'm not trying to tell you that at all. But I've learned some very valuable principles from that. And so you folks are here today to learn more and hear more about patents, and I would love to get started. Can we do that? Okay, thank you. I want to address the Bible and our Constitution again. This book is derived from this book. Okay? Our Bill of Rights comes from principles of the Bible. Our American flag comes from Scripture. So we have a very deep-rooted uh, foundation in our country here about our Christian heritage. And there are people who claim that we don't have that at all. And if I were to take you to Washington, D.C., 
And I can show you point to point to point to point. When you back up and look at it, it's a cross. It's a cross. That excites me. I want to share a thought with you. When we talk about patents, we talk, how many have heard the word colonial title, colonial patent? You ever heard that? Some of you have. Colonial comes from the old English law, and it means the king's land. Okay? The king's land. The king owned all the land. And therefore, when the barons began to pressure them and the common people were encouraging the barons of which to relinquish some of that land so that they could own their land, God put in the heart of most every man their own land. They have his own piece of land. You women, your nesters, you need a place to set up house and a home. God laid that all out. It's all laid out. And we have allowed through laziness, a good part, that we don't study. We'll watch the city evening news. We'll look at the internet. But we won't take time to find out what our rights are or how to maintain our rights. I've read numerous cases in the federal court. I do a lot of research in that area. The federal judges have said over and over, you don't know your rights, you don't have any rights. And it's true, isn't it? You don't know what to do. You don't know how to do it. You don't know what the cause and effect of it. So the unknown creates an element in human beings called fear. Okay? We fear of the IRS. We fear of the government. We fear of losing our job. And not that some of that shouldn't be concerned. But my Bible tells me that Jesus said, fear not. 366 times. I think it's pretty important if he made that much of an effort. You know, fear ends when faith begins. I want you to take your book just very quickly and after every chapter that I have put together in this book, there is a note and comment page. And as we address the subject matter within those chapters, there's about 35, 36 different subject matters here. If you want to write notes, what I'd like to do is when later on this afternoon, we have one gentleman that he's going to leave early, so I'll let him ask some questions. But I want to reserve the, most of the questions if we can so if you have questions, write them down in each one of the study matter. Every one of the chapters has got a note and comments page there. Okay? If you would, turn to page four. And I mentioned down about two-thirds of the way, it says, the right of land ownership comes from the Bible, Genesis chapter 28, verses 13, 14, and 15, and Genesis 47. I quoted you another one. And right below that, it says, the land patent is known in law as the letter patent. Patents are issued by the United States government, for those of you who may not know, was the way of dispersing the lands held in trust by the United States government to the private sector. In other words, to you, the individual. And so they did it by this thing called a letter patent. In most cases, it's a single page, just like a letter you'd send to somebody you want to communicate. The power and the authority and the jurisdiction of that document is phenomenal. And we don't use patents uh, language in our everyday life now. And I want to give you a little bit of history. Up until about 1944, when you bought a piece of land, 
you got the entire history, what we call the title or abstract of title as it's referred to. Okay? And that was toward the end of the war. And the attorneys got together, and the bankers got together, and the title company got together, and said, man, we we got to change something here. <coughs> so they did. What they did when they bought a piece of land and took the documents to the title company to be recorded, they took those titles and they reissued a warranty deed. How many of you are familiar with a warranty deed? That warranty deed provides you with absolutely no ownership in that land. It's called color of title, which means it's a phony. It resembles it, they represent it, but the true fact, it is not ownership. It's an equity interest in the land. So the states took these land letter patents and they put them in an archive file and now they classify this as being under administrative jurisdiction. Two jurisdictions. There is common law jurisdiction, constitutional jurisdiction, whatever you want to call it, and administrative. Whenever you hear the word administrative, it means corporation. When you hear the word federal in anything other than the name of, of certain banks have used that, but they're private corporations. I want you to write something down. And when you get to your computer, I want you to look up the Act of 1871. Now there are numerous acts that fall under that. But go to the one where Congress unlawfully incorporated the United States and made Washington, D.C. a federal district. Okay? At that point in time, from then on, they changed the names. They call it the District Court of the United States instead of the United States District Court. They use exactly the same words, the same letters, but they turn it 180 years. The people, they didn't know what that meant. Our original Constitution, by our forefathers, said the Constitution for the United States of America. There was dissension in the ranks even then. And there was pushing and shoving and shoving and jiving. Then they wrote a volume two constitution. You know that Montana has two constitutions. Oregon has two constitutions. Washington has two constitutions. One of them is called the organic and the other is called the volume one. And in that volume one, they substitute the word for to of. Now in law, when the word for is used in the context that it's used, it means dominant. Okay? Are you folks familiar with dominant and servient rights? Dominant means that it has a higher right, has more power, more authority, okay? When they substituted that and switched that one word, it meant that the Congress and the Senate and the, and the President could circumvent that. They promoted to us all these years of me growing up, oh, we got to follow the Constitution. They did it only if they wanted to. Now they're bold enough, they just totally ignore it. And that's what you and I are dealing with today, folks. You're dealing with a situation to where you have a rogue government, and I'm going to say something that a lot of you may not even understand, and I hope I can explain it clear enough. In Washington, D.C., in the state capitol here in Montana, in your county government, your city government, there is not one official occupying that seat that is a true government employee, whether elected or hired. You're saying, what? And I'll tell you why. The city's incorporated. When they incorporate, you're dealing with a corporate structure. 
You're not dealing with the government. They claim it's the government. They act as the government. But their stuff goes on behind the scene. They never tell you. And I have investigated numerous of these situations. One of them, the Rex and I was talking about yesterday, called a CAFR account. Very interesting when you get into that. Certified annual report. And that's just one of the many. And when you have a corporate structure, then in essence there's an element in law that states very clearly is throughout all law. And that is, you cannot have jurisdiction over that which you do not create or have not created. Do you catch that? You do not have authority over that which you do not create. So when these cities and counties and, and states and the federal government became corporations, they created a new you. And they did it in capital letters. Look at your driver's license. Look at your social security card. Look at your bank uh, check. An IRS correspondence or whatever. And if you don't understand that and know what to do about it, then you are subject to it by what's called in law tacit agreement. That means you agree by your silence. That's what's happened to our land ownership. Okay? Look at your tax bill. It'll be in your capital letter name. And that means that they consider you to be a subject. And I'm going to put it bluntly. A slave. We want to be free. And re restoring your land right and your land position is the first step and the most critical one that you'll ever do to do that very thing. There's an old saying, unless you own, land, own property, then you are property. Okay? Most of you know that you've tried to build something on your land. you got all these rules and restrictions and, and, and obstacles, and they let you move forward as long as you pay. Folks, that's not freedom. That's in bondage. And we need a lawful and proper government. I'm not anti-government. Don't misunderstand me. But we don't have one at any level in our country. And people don't know that because nobody's ever been bold enough to stand up and tell them the truth. My Bible tells me that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Because if you're working in a vacuum, you're working under a lie or a misrepresentation, it's a dead end street. Okay? So the authority and jurisdiction. Now I want to address that subject with you for a moment. <clears throat> an old English law when our forefathers came to this country they came here with a burning desire to be free free of religion, freedom of speech freedom to own the land etc etc and they brought with them the concept of an allodial title we call them paths but they're allodial and if you look on the front of your book on page four, at the very bottom, two lines. Excuse me, the bowl just above that. The following is referenced from the Commissioner of the General Land Office book, page 28 and 29, dated 1870. And I want you to read with me just that in the next part of the next page. The individual title derived from the government includes the entire transfer of ownership. That's what a lodial means. You get everything. Not only do you get the land, but you get the authority and jurisdiction. Okay? Very important elements. You don't just get the land. You get authority and jurisdiction. It is purely, on the next page, page five, 
a loyal with all. You notice that word all? What does all tell you? What does all tell you? Everything. Everything. Total. Complete. Without reservation or reserve. So that's how important this land patent stuff is. And our forefathers designed it that way. They knew what oppression was. They knew what it meant to have for a moment and then have it taken away because you don't follow the very narrow, strict line that somebody else is putting demand on. Does that sound familiar in our culture today? Sure does, doesn't it? One of the things that I like to share with people, our Constitution is not a self-executing document. Did you hear what I said? Our Constitution is not a self-executing document. It lays out the restriction. That's why that constitutional book is small. It gives the government, by we the people, who are the bosses, we're the kings, very limited latitude in which they're to function, and they're to do it at your nice direction. <laughs> that election, three years ago, whatever it was, two and a half years ago, and one of the local candidates wanted to go to Washington, D.C., and so we had a public meeting, and I stood up and I said, I have one question for you. And he said, what's that? I said, do you and your proposed administration <coughs> willing to follow the Constitution to the letter? Next question. <laughs> Did not even want to answer it. Told me everything. And I made a comment before I sat down. I said, you know the problem with people who are power seekers like yourself? And that is the fact that when you leave, if you get elected, you not only leave Oregon, but you leave us, the people. And you go back and you do your thing and you make your underhanded deals. And I said, my Bible tells me that one day you will stand before Almighty God I have to make an attempt. I want to show you this. How many of you have seen this? Yeah. This is a picture of the proposed land grab by the Agenda 21 program. The red is signifies that no human being is to occupy that land. Okay? Totally void of human beings, either recreational and anticipation. There you go. In a book we have back yeah. on the table. Okay, thank you. The yellow, guess what the yellow is? That's the buffer zone to the red. Very, very limited activity that can go on there. I'll pass that around. Did you take a look at it? In other words, folks, I'm trying to tell you, we better wake up. We better wake up. And I'll tell you why. That's part of it. But they're coming after you and your land, your savings, your retirement, and they want you in bondage. Do you know that the Agenda 21 program is to eliminate three quarters of the world's population? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be you? It's going to be me? Who survives? Who lives? Who gets selected or not? We've got some people with a sick mind, folks. They want to take everything you have. It's like a greedy man. The more money he gets, the more he wants. You folks here, I don't know if you understand how significant it is that you're here today. You people, if you would take what you learned here today and you would go out into your respective communities or wherever you're from and start planting the seed. My Bible tells me that God gives seed to the sower, but he gives a bountiful harvest to the receiver. 
There's a principle in Scripture is to give and it shall be given unto you. And if we're willing to sow the seed of knowledge and information, knowledge properly applied equals wisdom. Okay? You look up in your Bible in James 1 5, God said, If all ye who seek wisdom of God, ask, and he will give it abundantly. He's not stingy with wisdom. And yet, rather than spend a few hours or a few minutes even in the week's time and read our Bible and get and on our knees, we'll watch Dancing with the Stars and we'll watch a Sunday football game, and then we wonder why we have no rights. You've got to stand up, folks, and defend your right. If you're going to have rights, you need to be willing to defend it. If you want liberty, you need to be able to defend it. I want to share a story with you. Thank you. Thank you. Pardon me, I need to. When I was in the Marine Corps, we got pinned down 128 degree weather, and we ran out of water. My heavy equipment operator that was in charge of it. 12 man construction platoon. We went into areas in Vietnam that nobody else had ever been. We took horrendous casualties. And so when we got pinned down, I had to get some water for my men, find a way to sneak out through the jungle. <clears throat> Sun beating down 98, 99% humidity, incredibly hot and humid. And I knew we were in trouble. My operators, we're drinking between 8 to 12 gallons of water a day per man. Constant inflow, constant sweat. Shoes would rot off, our underwear would rot. I finally got out around the perimeter where we were pinned down and the drive to have water. And you folks are dealing with a water issue here in Montana. We're dealing with it in Oregon. We're dealing with it all over the western United States. I saw waterfalls. I saw fountains. And I knew I was in trouble. I knew it. But the drive to get a drink of water is phenomenal. It's like the fighting for life is phenomenal. Everywhere I went where there was a pool of water with nothing but jungle or a little old patch of grass. And I remember finally finding a little pool about from here to where these two gentlemen are sitting in the back corner. And I remember falling down in there on my knees. Put my hands in the water about four inches deep. The leeches started crawling up on my hands. And I remember looking at that and I thought, wow, look at that, that's kind of neat. You're losing, you know. Sun's cooking your brain. I drank out of that dirty rice paddy, felt like I was drinking boiling water. Within about, and I don't really know, because I went unconscious, but my tonsils blew up. Just exploded like a hand grenade. And the blood came out of my mouth and I went down. Next thing I know, I'm looking up and there's this funny thing going around. I found out later it was a medevac helicopter. They all made a visit to Da Nang Hospital, propped me up, no Novocaine, no nothing. And I remember when I was coming in and out of consciousness, that the doctor was saying, hold him still, hold him still, open his mouth. And they took a long, I didn't even see him because everything was a blur. But the corpsman told me later, they took those long curved scissors, suture, whatever they're called, you medical people know better than I do. But anyway, I'll call them scissors. And started cutting my tonsils out. No Novocaine, no nothing. And I'm telling you, I can't even describe the pain to you. 
They severed my vocal cords totally on the right side of my throat. Halfway severed them on this side. It was five years before I could get a normal conversation. Okay? I'm not saying that's what to do my horn. I'm just saying what I saw in that hospital is indescribable. What I saw on a battlefield is indescribable. After I got out of the hospital, I spent 28 days strapped to a bed on my side, hanging half over, bleeding into a five-gallon bucket. I got intravenous blood coming in, and I'm bleeding it out as fast as they put it in. Could not swallow, didn't have any water, and the psychological effect of that being what I had already been through that was vivid in my mind about no water branded something in my mind and in my heart. Part of why I studied water law. Water is life. And we better take the steps, folks, to protect it. And the land patent is the start of that, and I'll get into that in a bit. And I didn't mean to get off on this thing. The focus today is not me. But I'm just trying to illustrate a point. Now, <clears throat> I do a lot of this, and forgive me for doing that, but it's the only way that I can get my vocal cords to work. You'll notice my voice breaks at times. I can't help it. But anyway, I want to share a story with you. I study, and I study, and I study. Made a lifetime of study. I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with girls do. <laughs> <laughs> A little humor there on the road too. <laughs> but in my study of our American history, and I love American history, some of it has been so distorted. George Washington, during the Revolutionary War, started out with 35,000 men. Okay? Men who had a passion for freedom. Within less than about two years, he was down to 1,500. Listen to this, folks. Over 800 of those men had no shoes. In the middle of the winter, freezing weather, blinding snowstorm, had no shoes. They wrapped sacks around there and anything they could do, and they tie up with string, whatever they could find, vines, so that they would have something to walk on. And they said, Mr. Washington, what do we do? We're beat up, we're lack of material, we're hungry, we're tired, we're cold, and we're demoralized. The great leader that that man was said, let's get on our knees. That's what they did. <coughs> And they petitioned Almighty God for divine wisdom. When they finished their prayer, George Washington got up. And he said, we're going after the enemy. He said, okay. Cross the river in the dead of night, black as coal, freezing weather, blizzard snowstorm, and no shoes. Unbelievable. About 11 o'clock the following day, they caught up with the enemy. About 1,500 British were laying there sleeping. They killed over 800, took 737 or 35, whatever the exact number was. Within two weeks of that victory, they had 15,000 volunteers. That's what I hope you folks bring to the table when you leave here today. Folks, this is not a chore. It's an opportunity to salvage and to maintain freedom. I do marriage counseling. I've done it for about 30 years. And it's amazing what comes in my door when you have people that are emotionally at odds with each other. And I address the fact you've got a choice here. You can be bitter or better. You can be a victim or you can be victorious. Every situation is a stumbling block 
or a stepping stone as that an mature decision to make. The real problem is not what you're claiming or think it is. The real problem is your attitude about what you're dealing with. Okay? George Washington then went on to defeat the British. I want to share another little story with you and we'll get further in because I want you to understand what's at stake here, folks. Tremendous. The very existence of our nation may come down to you. It may. How many of you have sung our national anthem? We sing that at sporting events. We sing that at our church. We sing it at other sporting deals or rodeos or whatever. I want to tell you the story behind that. Francis Scott Key was a lawyer from Baltimore. And Washington had commissioned him to go out to the British ship and negotiate a one-to-one -one release of the British prisoners for the American prisoners. That was his commission. The British Admiral's ship was about a quarter of a mile offshore. They were after the port of Baltimore. And the way to get that, they had to destroy or get the United States people to surrender. Okay? They gave an ultimatum. You bring that flag down, I won't bombard Fort McHenry. He said no. So he negotiated all day long until about 2.30 in the afternoon, and finally the British Admiral agreed. Okay. He said, I'll trade it one for one, but he said tomorrow won't make any difference anyway. And Francis Scott Cheese asked him, he said, why not? And he says, because before darkness tonight, the majority of the entire British fleet is going to line up in my ship, and we're going to bombard that fort. And we're going to blow it off the face of the earth. And Francis Scott King said, you can't do that. The British Admiral said, why not? He said, because it's predominantly not even a military fort anyway. It's a storage facility, there are men and women and children there that are not involved in this. He said, then tell them to take that flag down. And again, Francis Scott Key said no. Pretty soon he looked upon the horizon and it looked like little dark dots. And in a few hours it got closer and closer. And just before dark, the entire British fleet was lined up. Cannons loaded and ready to bombard Fort McHenry. And the British Admiral said one more time, you take that flag down and I won't attack. He said no. He gave the command and the British Navy, the bulk of it, bombarded Fort McHenry with everything they had. All through the night, they could see the bombs bursting. When it went off, he could tell that the rampart and the flag had taken multiple direct hits. And the British Admiral came up to Francis Scott Keyes and he said, I don't understand you people. He said, well, just bring the flag down and the bombardment will stop. And Francis Scott Keyes remembered something that George Washington told him. He said, we, as the people who want to be free, and as Christians, would rather die on our feet than live on our knees. And the admiral got furious. He said, unload everything we have on that fort. And they did, for 25 hours. Unmerciful. Human life meant nothing. All for the cause of the, of the king and the queen and all of the other garbage that goes along with politics. During the bombardment at night, the prisoners were in the bottom of the admiral ship. 
Francis Trotsky would go down and the prisoners in that sinkhole said, what's going on? What's going on? Is the flag still up? Is the flag still up? And he said, yes, it is. And about three o'clock in the morning, Francis Trotsky started to back down into the hole to give them an update. And he said, all I could hear were men praying. God, keep that flag flying. Don't let it fall. Don't let it fall. He in the picture. Morning came, and about nine o'clock, Francis Scott Keys got in a boat and went ashore. And he went into Fort McHenry, and when he came around the corner, he got the shock of his life. The flag was still up, the rampart was leaning, the flag was ripped and torn, but it was still flying. And what he found was the men's bodies in stacks, very neatly placed, who had held that rampart up by hand. Okay? And when they died, others removed them and took their place. Wow. Wow. Freedom comes at great price. I lost 13 men in 12 days. Last nine months in the Marine Corps, I was selected to be a body escort. Took Vietnam casualties home to their family. Well, I tell you what, put that set of shoes on and wear them. But what an honor. You, you military, military people, service people, men, whatever, you stood up. Hallelujah to you. You're my heroes. Freedom is not free, folks. It's not free. Okay, back to our pattern. The oil with all the incidents pertaining to the title as substantial as in the infancy of the Teutonic civilization. Following the wake of this fundamental reform, the state land laws, several others were constituted appropriate. The statute was never adopted in the public states, and hence the complex distinction between the use of the trust has never embarrassed our jurisprudence. You know what it's saying there? It's saying you better not come and you better not infringe upon the landowner because it's his and you have no right to affect his land or his beast or his property or anything. That's what it's saying. Now we've got so many land regulations you can't even breathe. Here's the cover, a photocopy of the cover of the book that I got that Elodio quote out so that you know that it isn't something Ron's just making up. Comes out of the very general land office publication. They're the ones that write the, the, the regulation and how to implement the land patents at the direction of Congress. Okay? Wanted just, and I've given you quite a bit of the, I'm jumping around here, so bear with me. An overview on page seven of the land patents. This is just a little short, kind of an introductory thing, if I can put a title to it. The disposal of a land patent is conclusive evidence of the right title and interest in a particular tract of land granted to a private party and from the United States government. 
In addition to the granting of the land to the grantee, that's what a person is recipient of that because they grant and the recipient is a grantee, okay? The grantee, he also receives all of the authority and jurisdiction relating to that land. This is what is called a true title. Remember earlier in our discussion, we talked about the fact of a warranty deed? That's no title at all. That's just a document showing that you have an equity interest in that land. The land comes to, to you from treaty law. A lot of people do not understand what that even means. In other words, when there's negotiations or agreement between nations, they're called treaties. And treaties are law of the land. And if you look at the Constitution under Article 6, Clause 2 is called the Supremacy Clause. Okay? I want to read that to you. And I think you'll see where I'm going. This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made pursuant thereof, and all treaties made, of which shall be made, under the authority of the United States, shall be, shall in law means that it's mandatory. May means that you can be discretionary about it. So it will be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. And the thing in the Constitution and the laws of any state to the contrary are non-withstanding. Now I want to ask the question, what does that tell you? I want you to think, folks. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm trying to get you to think. What does that tell you? Who is bound? The judge, the tenant. In how, in what areas? Every state. And yet we have judges out there who are taking people's land by virtue of foreclosure, and we're going to get into that, that have no lawful authority to do any of that. A mortgage <coughs> and your land are not one and the same. We're going to get into that in the memorandum of law. They are not one and the same. And the attorneys and the courts and the legislature have all just lumped them together. You miss a payment, we'll punish you, we'll take your land. Absolutely pathetic. And I'll tell you why. Because it's a violation of the supremacy clause and it's a violation of the intent of Congress. And we're going to get into that. Congress intended for the poor man to get a twice a grant. It's free. The poor man couldn't afford it. So Congress said, we're going to set it up to where these people are free and own their own land and do what they want to do to be production, productive. That opportunity came by having land and owning land. Have you ever wondered why the United States has been such a powerhouse for so many years? It's for one, number one reason is because of private land ownership. Okay? There's an old saying, maybe I shared with it earlier, you don't own property, you probably are property. That's why God in his word puts such an emphasis on the ownership of land. It's important, folks, and you need to protect it, and you need to defend it. Because the way it's designed, it belongs to you, and you, and you, and on down the line. And we've gotten lazy, and we've gotten sloppy, and we've gotten ignorant. And I say that respectfully, but still, we don't study. Years ago, the educational system was required in all 12 grades to read from that book, the Bible. It's our moral compass, it's our rudder. 
God said, those who honor me, I will honor them. I'm not ashamed of my faith. The Bible said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. That horrifies me to death. To go in my last day and come and say, depart from me, I know you're not. There's going to be a lot of people in that. Because we think we know best. In this country, we've allowed God to be pushed out of our government. We've allowed God to be pushed out of our schools. We've allowed God to be taken down in the representation of crosses. And we wonder why. And I have a lot of criticism of the church. Most of them, not all. You folks in this part of the country have got a pastor that you may need to thank God of, Chuck Baldwin. And I'm not here to promote Chuck, but I can tell you that's a godly man who understands the whole segment of all of this stuff. <clears throat> the middle of the page, well, the one before it says your land on page uh, seven, is that your land comes to you from treaty through the land patent. This is critical. The land patent uh, <clears throat> secures the treaty's authority and jurisdiction. Okay? That's why the courts are bound. The judges are bound. Because it's treaty law. We either have a law of the land or we don't. And we do. And so as a result of that, when you receive a land patent or you bring your land patent forward, you get the land, you get the authority and the jurisdiction. It means that you have the total say of the, that you're king of your land. And I'm going to make a statement here. <coughs> we need to stop acting like slaves and start acting like kings. Okay? When you yield to somebody who claims he has dominance over you, you need to stand up. The Bible says expose sin right where it is. You can govern. That's what a constitutional republic is, of self-governance. The democracy is defined by two wolves and a baby lamb voting on what to have for lunch. Let me tell you what a republic is. A republic is two wolves and a lamb with his armed weapon saying, you're not having me for lunch today, tomorrow, or ever. If I can give you that analogy. We've always got somebody out there wants to have control of you. There's a proverb in the Bible that said, never was a lion so vicious as an ungodly man with power. Boy, do we see that today, don't we? <clears throat> the land patent is issued by the United States government to the grantee and the land patent stands forever I want to repeat that your land patent stands forever that's why on every patent every single one of them it says it's hereby granted, and it gives a name to their heirs and assigns forever. <laughs> Had a very lengthy discussion with an attorney in Florida the other day on behalf of a client of hers. And I've been called on many occasions to be an expert witness in court cases having to do with land patents and property rights and right-of-ways and water rights and whatever. <clears throat> and she kept coming up with this administration, the guy had done his land patent, by the way, and he has a mortgage and he struggled, and she's trying to defend him. And I said, you're doing the wrong defense. She said, what do you mean? And I said, you're trying to make a constitutional argument in an administrative court, and I said, they're not allowed. She said, what do you mean? I said, the patent comes with authority and jurisdiction. And that authority and jurisdiction stands forever, and its authority comes from treaty law. That treaty doesn't come from administrative jurisdiction. 
Okay? And so we finally got her to see the difference. Two and a half hours trying to explain it. And I've had a lot of trouble, and I want to say this respectfully, but with a lot of attorneys and judges, the attitude in a lot of them, not all, there's some dang good attorneys out there, and I'm not here to throw stones at attorneys, but a number of them that I have met try to portray that they're smarter than you and I are. And I don't know it all. I don't claim to know it all. But I'll tell you what, I study, and I have been in many, many, many debates having to do with land patents. And I can hold my own. This attorney made the comment, well, how do I know that what you're telling me is right, that it doesn't fall under an administrative jurisdiction? I said, very simple. I said, show me where the forever clause and authority in a land patent was ever removed. Got stone quiet on the other end of the phone. Now, I wasn't trying to throw stones at her. Pretty sharp gal, really. She then began to see, and that's what I hope I help you folks do, to see the power and the authority and the jurisdiction of a land patent. How many of you in here uh, own land? By that I mean I bought up, bought up. I don't care if it's paid for, but own it. Man. Okay, very good, thank you. You might give some consideration when we're all done here today about bringing forth your land patent title. This gentleman here asked me earlier, kind of a bullet point, of what is the benefits of a land patent? I want to go through that with you because very good question. Very good question. Number one, to bring your land patent, it's proof of your sovereignty. You and I are sovereigns, and by law, only sovereigns can own land. I didn't say real estate, I said land. Real estate is an administrative term, and it's used in the administrative rules and statutes and codes. Okay? The second thing to issuing or bringing your land patent forward is the very fact that you have protection. Protection. You say, well, protection from what? And I can honestly tell you, if you defend it from almost anything, that's an attack upon you and your land. Because it is instituted by God and is reaffirmed in the Constitution under Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2, 432, and it's called the land disposal portion of the Constitution. And in that disposal, it is a authority, but it's also a directive to Congress to dispose of the lands to you and I, so that we can acquire that land and go be productive, raise our families, raise a garden, raise cattle, cut timber, whatever the issue is. And I want to say something here, and I want you to listen carefully. All, all, all wealth comes from the ground. Amen. Okay? That a very interesting, I don't like to call it an argument, but it was almost that. With a guy that owned a whole chain of McDonald's, very wealthy man. He said, that's not true. I said, that's not true. He said, it all well comes. He said, I make about $17 million a year selling hamburgers. I said, really? I said, I have a couple questions for you. I said, what's that? I said, where'd you get the beef? Where'd you get the buns? Where'd you get the paper? Where did the building, the blocks, the bricks come from that made it? He said, how do you get to work? He said, to drive. I said, where, what made the car? Where did the products that made the car? 
He looked at me like a deer in the headlights. Hmm. Wealth comes from on top of the ground, trees, crops, whatever. It comes from under the ground in the form of mineral development. One of the patent issues, we're going to get into that in a minute, and I'll share it with you. There are 11 different types of patents. And that patent, the mineral estate, is phenomenal. And it is so misunderstood, it is so abused, the political sector thinks, we're going to shut your miner down. I have a film that I would share with Joel. Joel, where are you? There he is. As I, <clears throat> and the title of this film is called Out of the Rock. Phenomenal. And in that film, it's a mining educational film. The question is asked, what would your life be like without mining? Okay? Doesn't matter your political affiliation here, folks. Better set that aside for the point I'm trying to make. And it's asked again, and then the camera focuses in on a woman who's in her kitchen. That's a woman's domain, isn't it? Her kitchen. Wow, that's great. I thank God for you, women. And the question is asked one more time. What happens without money? The clock on the back wall disappeared. The toaster disappeared. The coffee pot disappeared. The window disappeared. The countertops disappeared. The stove disappeared. The oven. <coughs> Everything in that home poof, was gone. And if they'd taken it to the degree that it rightly should have gone, there'd be no house. She wouldn't have had on a dress, polyester, shoes, Glasses, your glasses are a product of a mine product. We sell a mine product. Your watch, your computer, your cell phone, fiber optic, paint. It goes on and on and on. It's endless. And one of the patents is, is, is mineral patents. Because of that came out after the Civil War, our forefathers understood the very fact that we better protect the mineral estate. And I'll tell you, one other main reason why it's so important. It is tied directly and significantly to national defense. Okay? How do you set a radar unit up to, in, to detect incoming enemy aircraft or submarines or build a submarine or an airplane or weapons or canteens? If you're interested, go to your computer and look Title 30, Section 1801 and 1803. You'll find that it's tied to national security, and rightfully so. Okay? <clears throat> Back to page 7. The American people, newly established sovereigns in this republic, after the victory, achieved during the Revolutionary War, became complete owners of the land, and beholden to no one. Getting back to your question, sir, about the, about the benefit, the bullet point. You're beholden to nobody. No building permits, no taxes, nothing. Now, having said that, I want to make freedom comes with responsibility. And freedom comes with accountability. So what you do with your land, don't hurt your neighbor. Okay? Because you don't want him hurting you. That's why you work together. You talk. You have coffee together. Invite him over for dinner. What's your plan about your life? What can I do on mine to help you? And vice versa. We've lost that. We've lost our honor, I believe. We've lost our honor. And there's nothing going to get right until we take personal responsibility and we reestablish our honor. When you give your word to something, you don't need a contract. If our handshake doesn't bind you and I, the paper we wrote it on is worthless. Isn't it? Amen. Amen. It's worthless. If your words go to no good, then your signature's no good. I was talking to Rex this morning coming in 
And I write a lot of contracts and have for years studied a lot of contract law. Most of my, con the, the most pages that I've ever had in a contract was three pages. But I try to make it one or maybe two. You're saying, well, why is that? I spell out the items, who's involved, what the terms and condition is, what the time frame is, and we both sign it. Attorneys have got into the practice in a lot of instances of putting all these legalese all into something to fight over. When in fact the whole focus of the contract is missed. Oh, let's fight over this plastic that's sitting in this dress instead of this one. How dare you? That's done all the time. One thing I learned in law school that is taught, not in my class, but it was taught to us that it's done in administrative law school. Controversy is an attorney's best friend. I'll charge you 200 bucks an hour for something he could solve if he would put his heart in it and really look at the, the protection of the individual. Because one day those attorneys and judges will stand before God. The Bible says that your sin will ever be before you. That isn't just the day of the judgment. That means throughout eternity. There's a lot of debate over that issue. I'm not here to cast anything on anybody. But what's in that Bible is either true or it isn't. And if it isn't, we better throw it in the trash. But I've never seen it fail. Never. Psalm 37, verse 25. David said, once I was young, and now that I am old. In other words, he'd spent a lifetime. I have never seen God forsaken. Those who love him who are called according to his purpose, nor their children go hungry. One verse that says, they are begging for bread. Same thing. He's faithful. The question is, are we? Our handshake. Am I faithful to my commitment to you? Are you faithful to your commitment to me? No matter what the cost, we shook on it. That was my dad. That was my dad. And my mother, too. My dad was a spiritual giant. <clears throat> We're going to take a break in a little bit to let you folks stretch your... Let me finish this up. These freeholders of the original 13 states now held a loyal title to the land that they possessed. If you want to know about possessory, go to Title 30, United States Code, Section 53. That has to do with the mineral estate in that particular instance, but it talks about the possessory title. You heard the, owner, the, the term, you know, possession is nine tenths of the law. Okay, that's a possessory right. And there's always somebody going to come along and try to tell you that you don't have a right to possess what's yours. This new and more powerful title protected the sovereigns from unwarranted intrusion or attempted takings of their land. And more importantly, it secured them the right to own an absolute <coughs> in perpetuity. What is the word perpetuity? Unending. Getting back to answering some of your questions. You have a piece of property that is to be secured in perpetuity without end. Doesn't that go along with on the patent that it says to their heirs and assigns forever? There must be something to this stuff then. You look at the Magna Carta, the very fact that the, the term forever relative to the heirs and that is mentioned multiple times multiple times. Let's take about a 10 minute break. We're back. Turn to page nine if you would. <clears throat> I want to share with you very quickly so we can move on. <clears throat> These are the different types of land patents. Uh, 
They're listed, there are 11 different types of land patents, and therefore, number one is the cash entry pat uh, patent as an entry that covered public land for which an individual paid cash or its equivalent. There are not very many of these. And the reason being is that they did this when there was a need to get the land under private ownership for a particular project or whatever. Land patents were to be issued by virtue in the way of a grant. These are a grant, but they're, a they're called a cash entry patent. They were actually paid for, and they're not supposed to be. But there were situations they had to make uh, a concession for, if you please. Number two, credit patents. These patents were issued to anyone who either paid cash at the time of sale or received a discount or paid by credit in an installment over a four-year period. If full payment were not received within the four-year period, the title to the land would revert back to the federal government. That's what a credit patent is. Number three, which most of you are under here, and that's a homestead patent. And a homestead patent allows a settler to apply for up to 160 acres of public land, and if they lived on it for five years and proved of cultivation and improvement, this land did not cost anything per acre. But the settler, excuse me, did fi uh, 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 pay the filing fee. And most of your lands here are under that type of, uh, of the land patent. Military warrant patents, number four. From 1788 to 1855, the United States granted military boundary and warrants as a reward for military service. Thus, warrants were issued to various <coughs> denominations and based upon the rank and length of service. Number five, mineral patents. This also applies much in Montana as well. The General Mining Law of 1872 defined mineral lands as parcels of land containing valuable minerals in its soil and rock. And there were three types of mineral patents that were issued under that. Number A is a load claim patent. Okay? Contains gold, silver, or other precious metals occurring in veins. In other words, in place rock, if you please. Number B is the placer patent. And the placer patents are minerals not found in veins or loads, information, <coughs> information, uh, load formation, get it right here, Ron, uh, loose gravel, etc. They're called alluvial. In other words, they've been moved by water or glacier. Number C, mill site uh, claim patents are limited to the lands that do not contain valuable miner minerals, and you could patent up to five acres to do your processing for your mining operation. Okay? Number six, on page 10, private land claim patent. The claim based one of the assertions that the claim of this predecessors and in interest derived the right while the land was under the domination of a foreign government. Not too many of those either. There are some, but not many. Number seven, railroad patents. A lot of these. A lot of railroad patents. Railroad patents to aid in the construction of certain railroads. The act of September 20th, 1850, granted the states <clears throat> uh, alternate sections of public land on either side of the rail lines and branches. Number eight, state uh, <clears throat> selection patent. These, each new state admitted to the union was granted 500,000 acres for public land for internal improvements establishment under that act. Number nine, swamp patents. Under the Act of uh, September 28, 1850, lands identified as swamp and overflow lands unfit for cultivation was granted to the state. Once accepted by the state, the federal government had no further jurisdiction over that parcel. Now, I want to stop there a minute. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Then what is the EPA doing running around the country, uh, fining people, threatening people, taking people to court, on the swamp land issue. Does an agent of the United States government have authority to do that? No. No. See, there's an element in our country of assumed authority. 
In other words, they just decide that they're going to do it. They just assume they have the authority. Has that been to court? It's kind of like the taxes. Has that been to court? Pardon? Has that issue been to court? Yes. And? Yes. The judges went along with it. Let's go on here. Town site patterns, an area of public land which has been segregated for disposal as the urban development, often subdivisions and blocks, and to further subdivisions into town lots. That's where you get your meets and bounds uh, and, and your lot numbers and all of that, okay? Because there were places that people began to congregate, and then therefore those definitions and patterns had to accommodate that. Number 11, town lot pattern may be regular or irregular in shape, and its acreage varies from that regular subdivision. Then I put a notation on that regular homestead patents, anyone applying for a homestead patent was required to do a mineral examination with the boundaries being claimed for patent to determine whether the minerals were found, whether minerals were found. If minerals were found within that said boundary before the patent issue, then the mineral did not pass with the patent. That's known as a noble decision. I want to read you something. I have a patent here, and it says subject to. Subject to is the reservation on a patent. Okay? Most of the subject to, I can't cross the line, I got in trouble. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. The subject to clause on a patent, and it's important that you understand this, <clears throat> is for the purpose of protecting a proprietary right. In other words, somebody that had a right before the patent was issued. And in that, initially when they issued homestead patents that they just lived on for five years and they issued the patent and come to find out that it was more mineral in character than it was of agricultural use. So, Noel who was the director of the general land office. A lot of conflict came between the miners and the, and, the, and the farmers, the agricultural people. And to bring peace to that issue. See, here's an interesting thing too. You know what the purpose of the law is? Have you ever thought about this? The purpose for law is to bring peace, not controversy. <clears throat> That's why we have the law of God. You stay within those bounds. God said, I'll protect you. I'll watch over you. I'll bless you. And on and on it goes. Okay? But that subject to clause was for the purpose of protecting miners' rights, ditches, ditch right-of-ways, uh, mineral holdings, getting back. The gentleman was telling me here about, about uh, being restricted going into his property. That subject to clause means that they can go down that ditch line, they can go down that right of way or whatever it is, and not be hindered by you, the landowner, because it's a proprietary right. First come, first serve, so to speak. Doesn't mean that they own the land, it means that they have a right to use that. That's on almost, not all, but a great deal of your homestead patents. Okay? <clears throat> the railroads are by far the largest patented landowner in the United States. Almost without question, every railroad land, whether there's a railroad or a siding or whatever, is still under the original patent never been taken out. They're not subject to regulation, and the uh, Transportation Division tries to put rules and regulations against the railroads. The railroads have been accommodated, but they don't have any authority to do that. Okay? Oh, the paragraph, second to the last paragraph on page 10, the reason that being at mineral lands of the United States is, and as of today, considered to be a separate state, it's known as a subsurface estate, 
versus the service of state. That's what the 72 clause addressed. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, the mineral is underneath the agricultural ground. The mineral right in these situations to where you have a separate estate, the mineral estate is dominant. In other words, the landowner of the surface cannot restrict and friends upon the right to remove the mineral. Now, there's an accountability. Whatever land that is disturbed or any damage that's done, the mineral developer has to pay the surface landowner. That's to keep everything in balance so that the mineral people don't go in and tear it up and leave the landowner with a useless piece of ground because he had a right to the mineral. But again, that's a good neighbor policy, okay? Alrighty, on to page 12. I'm not going to spend much time on the additional land patent information. You can read that when you have time because we have a lot to cover here today. Uh, I want to read at the bottom of page 12, the last paragraph. It talks about the land patent, and, let, and I quote, This is the only lawful method of a perfect, perfect title can be held by the grantee's name. And there's a court case there, Wilcox versus Jackson. There's a little field versus register, and on and on. And I've got a lot of court cases in this book here, in case you haven't had a chance to look. Okay. Um, on page 14, top of the page, the patent is prima facie conclusive evidence of title. Now that brings up, let's see what I did with that. I'm going to throw a little bit of a trick question here to you. This is an actual copy of a land patent. Okay? And I have a copy of one of mine in the back of it, toward the back of the book. Mm -hmm. This is only the evidence of your title. You're going to what? Everybody think this piece of paper is the title. No, it's not. It's the evidence of your title. Your title is in the law. You with me? And it's an enactment by Congress. We call them congressional acts. And that act of Congress has said that the land will be disposed by a lodial title to the person who applies for it. And if you qualify, then it's yours, lock, stock, and barrel without any encumbrances and you get the authority and jurisdiction with it. So they give you evidence of that. And that's called a letter patent, that's what these are. I have one here from Canada, same thing. Canadian land patents are two pages. For those of you who can see, I'm kind of flinging them around here. But all of these patents, every one of them without question, says that there are signs Errors and the and signs forever. Now I'm going to pose a little bit of a hypothetical question. If every patent has that on it, then there must it must mean something, doesn't it? One would think so anyway. And it's a reminder to everybody that views a patent that it is in perpetuity without end. And I've had some heated discussions with judges in chambers relative to this very subject matter. Not a one ever, ever has been able to show me to where the forever clause has ever been removed or that it can even be removed because it cannot. These are perpetual. This patent is just as effective and with authority and jurisdiction and standing today as it was in the 1800s when it was issued. It's a present past, a patent, not a past history. I get government people trying to tell me all the time, oh, those are no good. I have attorneys tell me, oh, you don't use those anymore. They're no good. That's old stuff. My question again, how long is forever? How long is perpetuity? It was intended to be just that, folks, to protect you, the landowner. 
Okay? Another issue, getting back to your question about the benefits, the land patent cannot be collaterally attacked by anybody except the United States government within two years of the date of issue. There's no provision in law to collaterally attack a land patent. Now, I want to talk about mortgages a moment. How many of you have a mortgage on your land? Okay. How do you do? And if a person gets behind in their payment and the mortgage company wants to come and take your land for it, there's no authority in law to take that land. None. 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 Because a mortgage is not a title. A mortgage is a lien position relative to money that has been extended. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Banks and judges and courts have been treating foreclosures as though the bond between the promissory note and the trustee and the land is as one. You default, we take it all. A number of things wrong with that concept, folks. And here it is. Number one, it's a violation of the intent of Congress. Number one. Number two, it's in violation of the Supremacy Clause. Number three, it violates the Forever Clause relative to the land patent, the letter patent, that is concrete, if I can use the term, in law. It's by a congressional act that's backed up by the power of treaty. Now, I'd like anybody to show me who think a mortgage has a right to come and take the land. Another problem with that is that it's an unjust enrichment. There's an element of law called unjust enrichment. That means when you do something relative to your action or an action in, in court of which you have undue benefit to you that you don't rightly deserve. You with me? Yes. The mortgages are enforceable. Against... You have to speak up. I can't hear you. The mortgages are enforceable against warning deeds, but not past. That is correct. And we'll get into that. A warranty deed is under administrative law. A land patent is under common law and constitutionally protected. Very important that you understand that. I have never been able to understand why an attorney does not turn around and go and defend. He could have business forever. Trying to help somebody save their land instead of allowing it to take it or be instrumental in taking their land. I think there's going to be an accountability to that the way I read my Bible, and I'm speaking for me here. There's a wonderful place for attorneys. I'm not throwing stones at all attorneys, I'm not. But I think there's a great problem with the priority about our legal system today. You see evidence of it everywhere, okay? The bottom of page 14, if a land grant patent is not challenged by any and all, <clears throat> and all claimants are talking about when you post your land patent sandwich, uh, if you're going to bring your land patent forward, that has to be done by law within 60 days of the posting. <clears throat> The first day that you post your paperwork to bring your land patent forward does not count because the courts have said it's got to be a full day to be counted. So you do not count. So in other words, you leave it on the bulletin board or whatever for 61 days. If there is not a challenge to the standing of your land patent, now understand this, it's got to be a legitimate challenge. It can't be a frivolous thing, or you have cause of action against the perpetrator. But if somebody's got some legitimate paperwork that really needs to be taken a look at, they have 60 days to do that. If they do not, 
Your paperwork, as well as in law, bars them from ever making a claim toward that. Okay? Alrighty. Next one, page 16. The law on rights, privileges, and immunities. When a land patent is, is transferred by patenting title and rights of a bona fide claim purchaser will be protected. Drop to page 16. In other words, it's mandatory for the court system to protect a bona fide land patent. Gets back to the supremacy clause, doesn't it? Article 6, Clause 2, United States Constitution. All judges are bound. Now let's talk about that a moment. A judge can affirm a land patent in a lower court setting because they're bound to do that. But they cannot rule against it. They do it. But there's no lawful standing to do that. And the Constitution says, and there are case law on that, that when a judge violates his oath, he wars against the Constitution. Violating your property and your property right is a warring against the Constitution. The framers of the Constitution made it absolutely clear and I've read all the documents, I have the documents, state that that land is to be protected. Even the United States government once issued the land patent after the two year period of time cannot assault that land patent. They have two years and only two things apply of which gives them authority, the government who issued the land patent. And that's for fraud, or for obvious error in the paperwork. Only two items. Not because they feel like it, not because the political winds are blowing that direction. There has to be evidence of fraud, or there has to be true evidence of clerical error. That's only for two years. Okay? There's a time limit. There's a very famous case called Fletcher versus Peck. And it basically states, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it states there that the grantor divests his ownership and relinquishes to the grantee. There is an immediate and perpetual estoppel. And estoppel means just that. You're barred from proceeding any further. Okay? Fletcher versus Peck. It's in the book a little later on. Kind of jumping ahead a little bit. Okay. Go to page 18. And I stuck this in because I come from Oregon, but this equally would apply to Montana and any other state. But this just shows the preamble of the Admissions Act for Oregon when they applied to statehood and became a state. This says preamble, whereas the people of Oregon are framed and ratified and adopted the constitution of state government, which is a Republican in form. I want to stop there. Our constitution guarantees both our federal constitution and our state constitution, all of them, that we're guaranteed a republic form of government. Where is it? We're operating as a democracy, not a republic. That's why when you notice when we get into the land patent stuff, at the heading of the documents that I'll show you that's in the book, that it's a republic. And it has to be in that jurisdiction in order to bring that land patent forward and to make your, your certificate of acceptance. Land patents to bring forward have to be accepted. I read all kinds of stuff on the internet, I read papers, to where they only use what's called the Declaration of Land Patent. That's absolutely worthless. And the reason being, the land patent is already being declared. You can't declare that. 
You acknowledge it by your certificate of acceptance of that declaration of the land patent. You understand what I'm saying? The land patent, the letter patents, are what we define in law as prima facie evidence documents. And that simply means it says what it says, and it means what it says, until it's overturned, it stands as read. It's like an affidavit of fact. When you give your personal testimony of events that you personally are aware of, you do it in what's called an affidavit or an affidavit of fact. Unless that's rebutted item by item within 30 days, it stands forever. So if you ever have to do an affidavit, keep that in mind. Republic form of government. We're guaranteed that and we're not practicing it. And we wonder why we've got all the problems that we have. Getting back to the two wolves and the baby lamb voting what to have for lunch. That's what that means. Mob rule, if I can put it in another context. Two people can outvote one, so you lose all your personal and individual rights and you use your property. That's a democracy. Every democracy in history, and I'm an avid history buff, both biblical and our national history, has ever survived a democracy. Every single one has gone down in flame. That's what's made our country so unique, because our foundation was God-based, our foundation was a republic. You can, can rule you better than I can, huh? And you, and you, and all the rest of you. What right have I got to come and tell you what to do, or how to do it, or when to do it? And then charge you for the, for the privilege of trying to dominate you? Insanity. Absolute insanity. That's what we're doing. I want to share a thought with you folks. And please hear what I'm saying. I believe there's three types of people in the world that I've observed in my 67 years. First one, those who make things happen. And there are some people in here who are doers. Okay? And God bless you for it. We're made by the Creator, and we need to be created with our God-given gifts, I believe. So the first one is those who make things happen. Number two is those who watch things happen. And the third one is those who wonder what happened. <laughs> okay. Which is the majority? <laughs> Do I really need to answer that? <laughs> I appreciate your being able to do it. But understand this, folks. We laugh at that little statement that I made. But unfortunately, it's true. And having said that, I want to pose a question to every one of you in this room. Which one are you? Which one are you? Are you a person who makes things happen? Are you a person willing to make things happen? Are you willing to step out in faith and do what you can do with your God-given ability? Or are you number two? Uh, this watch. We got a lot of watchers. A lot of watchers. Or are you number three? You wake up one day, what happened? I wonder what happened. We better get that back in balance. Because you are seeing the cause and effect of your land, your rights, your property, your income, your savings, your retirement, wherever you want to close your eyes and point your finger. Because remember this, our adversaries are doers. Mm -hmm. They're doers. Because we're seeing it's being done. And we're sitting here, what happened? We have a very false sense of security in this nation. Because we have been so blessed and so protected by God, for so many years, 
But we pushed him out, and we wonder why the enemy is now just in mockery with their tail on fire coming at us. The Bible says we fight not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual and power, powers in high places. Okay? We have a spiritual battle that we're seeing manifested in the physical. That's why we need the aid of Almighty God. George Washington recommended. Do you know that every war that's ever been fought has been fought with less than two and a half percent of the populace? That's why you guys are my heroes. I salute you. Revolutionary war with less than two and a half percent. The War of 1812 was less than two and a half percent. World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam, on and on it goes. A few select men and women who have set up, stood up, and stepped up to the American public and our way of life and given a blank check that may cost them their life. Okay? Freedom, not free. <clears throat> Therefore, in section four, contains <clears throat> the proposition offered to the people of Oregon for acceptance or rejection. Part five is uh, <clears throat> percentum of the net proceeds of the sale of the public land lying within each state, said to be held and sold by Congress. And there's a whole mathematical figure that they came up with in these admission acts, etc. That the foregoing proposition herein before offered are the condition that the people of Oregon shall provide by ordinance irrevocable without cons consent of the United States that the said state shall never interfere with the primary disposal of the soil within the same of the United States or with any regulation Congress may find necessary for securing the title in said state soil to bona fide purchaser thereof, and that in no case shall a non-resident uh, <clears throat> proprietor be taxed higher than a resident, and it gives a statute there. Now that's a very interesting that is in all of the enabling acts. When the state relinquished the land, only one state in the United States did not do that. That's Texas. That's why Texas is known as the Lone Star State. That's why they call it the Republic of Texas. Texas said, we're not giving our land back. We bled, fought, and died to have this land, and we're not giving it up. But the other states did, Oregon, Montana, Idaho, and on and on and on and on. But that very thing that I read to you in the enabling match forbids the state entering any state legislation, law, enactment, policy that in princes upon your land. Okay? Another protective covenant. What we call in the law, they're called protective covenants. So when Congress was mandated by Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2, to dispose of those lands, the states had nothing to say about it. And here's why. Because of forever clause, the continued down the element of time that that protective covenant to protect you and your land. You, you, you get in the picture here? Very important that you understand it. If you don't, boy, speak up. Because if you don't, you don't won't understand how to protect it. It's not a self-executing document. We had an incident in Clama Falls, Oregon, 20, 25 years ago. They came after the water like they're coming after your water. 1,200 families said, you're not taking the water. Just like Bundy said, you're not taking our water and our land and our grazing, whatever. And they stood up and you saw what happened. The greatest fear government has is for you to have cahotes enough to stand up 
and said no. They came after those people of water. The day the federal agent showed up, there were 1,200 families, wives with shotguns and pistols and kids with 22s. And they said, somebody's going to bleed and die here today if you try to take our water. The federal agents threatened. They said, what are you going to do to take our water? They were trying to do that. I talked to one of those federal agents about two months after that incident. They finally turned around and said, hey, we're out of here. I'm not dying over that water. That federal agent said, that scared me to death. I have never seen the public bear arms against me. And I'm the one wearing the badge and the pistol. Said, that scared me to death. Do you realize how much power you have? That's why we have a Second Amendment. To protect your life, your family, your liberty, and your property. There's a place for negotiation. But when it's obvious it isn't going to work, then you better be willing to take the next stand. Are you a doer that makes things happen? You're going to watch things happen and watch our nation crumble because we don't have any guts and no backbone. That's what this is about here today, folks. We're talking about land and land patents. But it's much, much bigger than that. But that's the foundation. What is your decision? What, which one of the three are you going to be? I pose that question to you folks here today. Okay? <clears throat> At the bottom, page 18, the Act of Congress admitting Oregon into the Union on February 14, 1859, established for the state, shall never interfere with the primary disposal of soil. <laughs> Look at the word never. <coughs> How long is never? Not as long as forever. <laughs> <laughs> you see my correlation to the forever, and now it's never, and it's in perpetuity, which is without end. String gets longer, doesn't it? Those are protected covenants. The state's responsibility as a government is to protect you and your land and your rights. Now they work like hell and hard as they can to try to take them away from you. What are we doing? What are we doing? I look like that. Turn to the next page, page. Yes. I, I guess I don't, I'm not clear on what what's going on there. So, so Oregon become part of the United States transferred its rights. To I'm sorry, sir. I've got a hearing defect from uh, Vietnam. So, so for Oregon to become a member of the United States, it trans the state transferred its rights to its state land to the federal government. On all unappropriated lands went into the to the, the federal trust, the trust the United States set up, and treaty demanded that. The, the land did not go to the United States. It went into trust land. And when the states became states, by the law of possession, then the states acquired that land and title to that land. So in order for them, they said, well, let us do the disposal. We were still trying to build a country here. Right. So then they relinquished that land back to the trust for the Congress to dispose of those land back to the individual of the state, of each of the states. Okay, so that land in all these states, but Texas is still in that land trust federal government. Federal the government. only land that's in the land trust are the public lands and the public domain. All this patented land that you folks own is out of that trust and is in your private possession, private ownership, and private authority and jurisdiction. It was transferred back that is correct. by patent title. And that's what the patent does. Okay. All right. The patent is the evidence of law. <coughs> okay. the, the ownership, the right title and interest comes from law, which is called Act of Congress. Yes? But, and uh, that trust is, by law, necessarily disposed of, not kept in that is the federal trust. So that is when correct. the feds 
have not disposed of it, they're in violation that of their own law. I'm going to get into that later today about FLIPMA. How many of you know about FLIPMA? Federal Land Policy Management Act. Unlawful as it can be. So many holes in that bucket. I can compare it to a screen door in a summary. <laughs> Congress cannot self-enact an enactment to take the public land. Hear what I said? Public land. That is a federal land. I get irritated when people go, well, that's green oil land, that's orchard land, that's government land. No, it isn't, unless it's a military base or a shipping dock. It's yours, folks. Yes? Change to make, I mean, most of the eastern states have no federal land or very little. So what change, all the western states seem to have massive reserves that the federal government owns. What do because you the federal government violated the contract agreement between the states and the federal government when they agreed if they would uh, transfer the land into the, the, the federal trust for disbursement, not for possession, but for disbursement. They didn't do that. The federal government reneged upon the contract agreement of the states. Wasn't that just the western states? Just the western states. East, excuse me, west of the Mississippi. But we're talking about the Enabling Act now. That is correct. Right. You going to get into that later at all? Yes. And that has to do with the point in time and the realization of the great wealth of minerals and uh, resources in the western states. That is the whole reason why they did not dispose of the rest of the land. Okay. The unfortunate thing that we find, and you folks know it as well as I do, that we have greedy people in government. Mm -hmm. And we have greedy people who are not in government. The Bible says, it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? I've done all the Ten Commandments. Pat himself on the back. And it's commendable. The Lord said, yeah, you did do that. But only one thing I ask. Sell all you have and follow me. The rich young ruler turned and walked away. Lazarus in the Bible and Abraham talks about that rich young ruler, about the great crevasse that's ever in. Yes? Sir, um, so when we're talking about land transfers, Speak up, please. when we're talking about land transfers from federal, uh, I mean, from the yes. states to the federal. States okay. to federal aid, right. we'll say. I mean, Roosevelt and a couple presidents before that did it with executive order. Now, we're still living under that. I mean, to me, that is just growth. We didn't follow the will of the people at all. Just this morning, let me bring that up. Thank you for that question. As Rex and I were driving in and Joel, I got a call from one of my researchers. I got some excellent research, and these guys are phenomenal. <clears throat> I told him we got some issues about they want to expand the wilderness area and the monument, tie them all together. My two counties, Jackson and Josephine County, Oregon, are the two richest independent counties of any place in the western United States. There have been mineral surveys that have been done enormous mineral wealth, and we're broke. Sheriff Department has two patrolmen, it's that eight. County can't do this, can't do that. Part of that's a misappropriation of money, but that's a whole different issue. But the point that I'm making here, I've done extensive research on the Wilderness Act and the uh, <clears throat> Monument Act and all of those, with the exception of two. They're all unlawful. Do you hear what I said? All the two are unlawful. It is required that those lands, if they're going to be tied up, has to have a mineral survey done. Because if you go to HR, once you write this down, HR 365, it's called the 1866 Mining Law. And I want you folks to go read that when you get a chance. It's called HR. Henry Ron 365. 
called the 1866 Mining Law, has 11 parts to that act. And that grant granted to you and I all of the minerals in the United States that has not already been claimed. You have as much right to go search for minerals, make a claim as I do. I've been in the mining business 40 years. True of everyone in here. That was granted, G-R-A-N-T-E-D, to you and I. Once a land is disposed, I shared with you under Fletcher versus Peck, excuse me, and many other, many other cases. That land is then divested from the United States authority and control, other than administrative for the mineral claimants that come on that land. It's called public domain. Public lands and public domain are not one and the same. Domain means that the land has not been appropriated for any use. But that does not mean that the mineral potential to acquire that mineral is not available because it is available. Does that make any sense to you? That's why it's called a claim. You file a mining claim. Very important. When Congress disposed of those lands, the mineral I'm talking about, there can be no other claim put on it. And yet they're giving it away to to uh, wildernesses and all of these different uh, monument areas and study areas and this and that. Totally, totally, totally unlawful. Congress does not have the authority to do that. They've already predisposed that land. Okay? There's a case law to lower on it. Okay? If you notice at the bottom of page 18, by the United States or any regulatory Congress may find necessary for securing the title in said soil to a bona fide purchaser thereof, and the supremacy clause, property clause, commerce clause, or the national mining law. These are elements of protection for the granting of properties within a state. Okay? Alrighty, page 19. I threw this in. It's not applicable to Montana because Montana has its own. I just didn't have it handy to put it in the book when I need to get this down. And it's called ORS, Oregon Revised Statute 164.075. And this basically says, and I'm going to paraphrase it here for you. This says that it's a state enactment that any infringement upon your private property is a felony. Okay? It's a felony. The state and the enactments of those laws, it's theft by extortion of whatever means. And that's important for your state. You have one of these too. I just don't have the number here at this point. Very important. What is trying to tell you in all this that I've shared, your patented land is important and it has a lot of protective covenants to it. Okay? Another benefit of all the multiple protective covenants. There's an element of law, it's Latin, it's called paramaterra. Paramaterra simply means that whenever there is a potential challenge or any legislative uh, proposed uh, enactment, they have to go back and look at all of the savings clauses together. Here's what we're doing. The legal system is picking one thing out and then they attack it from this way and that way and whatever and totally violate the protective covenants of your land and your rights. It's called Paramaterra. I have a document it's called the Congressional Record of 2000. Incredible document. I want to encourage you to go look it up. I wish I had brought it. I'd be glad to share it with you. 
but they tried to take some property from people in northern Nevada. And in that, it ended up going clear to Congress for testimony. And Congressman Jim Gibbons from Nevada had addressed the issue under professional testimony, expert testimony, of the very fact of all of these protective covenants having to do with your roads that are under RS-2477, which means roads that are prior to 1976, are protected. The Forest Service, the BLM, cannot close those roads. There's no provision in law to do that. None. Because they have a proprietary right. And they have a right by virtue of all of the paramateria, the saving clause, for you and I to have access to our land. It's our land. It's not government land. And I get irritated when I hear, well, that's Forest Service land. I want to see the title. We're going to break to have a lunch here. I want to share one quick story with you. I was called as a consultant to a criminal charge against a minor. And this minor had found a mental claim that had been abandoned. And I'm talking about statutory abandonment. In other words, by law, it was abandoned. In other words, it was open for him to go in and to claim that land. He did that, did the research, was clear. He claimed that land, cleaned it up, took five three-quarter ton pickup loads of trash, of metal. The hippies had had it and had a drug, uh, pot growing uh, operation going for a number of years. The BLM never did a thing about that. Once he followed on that mental claim, cleaned it up, cleaned it, there was a cabin there, a cute little cabin, pretty well structured, cleaned out, had mice and rats and an old soap and recliner and cans and garbage, cleaned that all up, painted the inside. Forcer, or the BLM came along and arrested him for federal theft of federal property, <laughs> or under the theft of federal property. He said, you done to tell me that that's your property? How come you didn't clean it up? That's your right. See, they're supposed to clean that stuff up. Make a long story short, took him to jail, booked him, next day turned him loose, and filed five criminal charges against him. Okay? So when he got an attorney, he said, the uh, public defender, in most instances, I'm very adamant against that because they usually sell you out. But he got a good one. Young lady, sharp gal, sharp gal. He said, I want Ron Gibson to be a consultant to you because this was related to mining. She agreed. Yes, sir. So I came in, we met. She said, tell me about the mining law. We spent all afternoon giving her my Reader's Digest version of the mining law. I teach mining law. And she said, very interesting. So anyway, we went through the learning curve and the right of ingress and egress and the right of, of possession and the of mining claim acts as a patent, even though you don't have the paper. It has that protective covenant because it's tied to national defense. We go to court. And as we're in the courtroom, the prosecutor calls four Bureau of Land Management witnesses. Your name, and I'll skip a lot of the stuff. And anyway, all of them said, the prosecutor and the attorney said, uh, this land said, well, whose land is it? And he said, um, it's BLM land. I've got to bend over my back, folks, sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going, oh, God, God, God. she didn't hear me. Four witnesses. Finally, I got a note, slipped it to Dusty, the defendant, got it to her. I said, call a recess. So about 10 minutes later, she called for recess. We went outside the hall. And I said, Greta, I said, you've got to call those witnesses back from the Bureau of Land Management. She said, why? And I said, because you allowed them to give testimony that the ownership of that land belonged to the Bureau of Land Management and not to Dusty Ford. Said, oh, you're right. I forgot all about that. 
So we go back into court, about eight, ten minutes later, she tells the, the judge, I want to recross examination some of the Bureau of Land Management uh, witnesses. Is that okay? So she calls him up. She did a beautiful job. She just absolutely filleted those <laughs> witnesses. It was unbelievable. I was so proud of her, I wanted to give her a kiss. <laughs> no, she did a good job. And so let me give you one instance, and then it was repeated, then we'll go to lunch. She said, you're under oath. So your testimony still is subject to, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, yeah. And uh, my mind's going 100 miles an hour, I work like that. She said, you testified earlier that this land belonged to the Bureau of Land Management, did you not? And he said, yes. <clears throat> she said, uh, well then, do you have the title with you? And the guy said, pardon me? She said, the question I ask you, do you claim that you gave personal testimony under oath that you in fact testified that this was BLM land, is that correct? And he said, yes. She said, do you have the, the title with you? He said, well, no. She said, well, do you have it at your office? She said, well, no. She said, well, is it anywhere in the BLM building in Medford? Well, I don't know. She said, wait a minute. You testified that under oath that this was BLM land. I want to know how you know it's BLM land. Where's the title? Have you seen the title? No. Have you ever not known anybody that saw the title? No. I mean, she just carves this guy's testimony up. It was beautiful. <laughs> She said, then what you're telling us in this court, that you perjured yourself because you don't know that it belongs to the Bureau of Land Management, do you? Well, I'm sure it does. She said, that isn't my question. Do you or do you not know that this land belongs to the Bureau of Land Management? She said, you don't, do you? Because you can't produce the title. You haven't seen the title. You just testify to that, which is it. You testified before that you knew it was. Now you're saying you don't know. So what that tells me is in the court, you don't know. Isn't that correct? Oh, well, yeah. You're excused. Call two more of the four. She called total three. She then calls Dusty Ford, my friend. Puts him on, gives his name, all of the pertinent stuff like attorneys do. Said, Mr. Ford, do you believe that you have a right to that land? He said, yes, ma'am, I do. She said, on what basis do you have a right to that land? He said, by my title. The whole jury, they straightened up and said, title? He said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, do you have a title with you? He said, yes, ma'am, I do. She said, may I see it? said, yes, ma'am. Opened his coat up, pulled out, had a eight and a half by eleven folded up. She said, would you please tell the court what this is? Said, this is my mental claim filing, which I did in accordance with the law, signed it, dated it, paid the fee to the county, had it properly recorded, and he pointed to it, and she held it there for him. Said, then I sent it to the Bureau of Land Management in Apartment Oregon, and they accepted it, staffed it, and issued me an ORMC number. She said, would you tell the court what an ORMC number is? That's Oregon Mining Recorded um, Claim. 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 ORMC, Oregon Recorded Mining Claim, excuse me. <laughs> and it said, they issue a number. She said, that's his number at the top. And he said, that by law is my title. She said, well, how do you know it's your title? He said, Title 30, Section 53, the law of possession. One of the jurors said, may I see that? Attorney said, your honor? She said, you bet. She hands him the document. She said, all the jurors are 
trying to receive that document, <clears throat> passed it around. It took the, the jury less than 10 minutes, not guilty on all counts. That's what your patent title is to do for you. Okay? It's your title. It belongs to you and to you alone. Not to the state, not to the government, not to the EPA, none of that. Quickly, let's move on. <clears throat> I'm going to jump around here a little bit, the reason being we need to cover a subject here very quickly about how to bring your land path forward. I don't want us to run out of time because what I want to do, or like to do, but it's up to you. <clears throat> Toward the end of the day, I'd like to have at least an hour and a half, maybe two hours of question and answer. Uh, so I'd like to cover this stuff because probably a lot of your uh, <clears throat> questions are going to be related to this. But before we go any further, I want to read you something. It's a case. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this case is called the City of Dallas versus Mitchell. And I want to read this to you. It said, the right of the individuals are not derived from governmental agencies either municipal, state, or federal, or even the Constitution. Remember what I shared with you earlier that our rights are inalienable. The Constitution just reaffirms them, okay? And also the Constitution puts a limit on the government. They exist inherently in every man by endowment of their creator and are merely reaffirmed in the Constitution and restricted only, listen to this carefully, restricted only to the extent that they have been voluntarily surrendered by the citizenship to the agencies of government. Hello? Let me read it again. You better catch this, folks. And it doesn't get any more important than this. Your rights, they exist inherently in every man by the endowment of our Creator and are merely reaffirmed in the Constitution and restricted only, only to the extent that they have been voluntarily surrendered by the citizenship to the agencies of government. Wow. Give us that sighting again. Mitch, the city of Dallas, it's in the book. Okay. It's in the book. Yes. Can I juxtapose this with the Erie Railroad Doctrine? Are you familiar with that? Where, uh, I'm sorry, Joe, I can hear you. Can I juxtapose this with the Erie Railroad Doctrine when 1934, it was presumed that everybody has given up their rights to become a federal person. You have no rights. If you have a social security number, any sovereignty you used to have has been overlaid, you have not. Yes. Now I want you to understand what's being said here. <clears throat> Remember me addressing the issue of jurisdiction and authority, or authority and jurisdiction? You're the king, folks. I want to go back. This book is called The Constitution for the United States of America. Do you know that when this was drafted, it went to the Commonwealth of Delaware with the first recipients of the constitutional draft for signing? The people in the Commonwealth of Delaware said, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's something missing. And I don't know, I can't find enough of the record to make a positive determination, but it brings me to the conclusion of two potential causes. They added the first sentence to this document, and the first three words are what? We the people. Little did they know, or maybe they did know, by divine intervention, I don't know. But that 
based upon our constitutional document, made you and I kings of our land. Okay? And I said earlier, we need to stop acting like slaves and start functioning like kings. Because you are. It's your decision. Remember, we talked about the three people. Let me read the rest of this quickly. <clears throat> the people's rights are derived from <clears throat> the government, but the government's are not derived by the government, excuse me, but the government's authority comes from the people. We're the boss. We're the king. That's where administrative law has switched 180 degrees. Now the government wants to be the boss and we're the slaves. <laughs> the Constitution <laughs> states again that these rights already exist and that the legislative encroachment by nation, state, or municipality invade those, those original and permanent rights. Permanent rights. Permanent rights. What's permanent mean? Without end, isn't it? Forever, however you want to define it. In perpetuity, all of those are molded into one. Another protective covenant, folks. You only give up your, don't have rights if you give it up. <clears throat> That's the value of these permanent rights. It is the duty of the courts. We get back to Article 6, Clause 2, the Supremacy Clause. The duty. Most people don't even understand, especially politicians and the legal profession, what duty even means anymore. Same with uh, uh, your fiduciary responsibility. Every elected official, every hired person in government has a fiduciary responsibility to you, their boss. And why we sit still and let them tell us is beyond me. And I pray to God from this day forward that you don't put up with that. Okay? It is the duty of the courts to declare and to afford the necessary relief. The fewer restrictions that surround an individual liberty of the citizen except those for preservation of the public health, safety, and morals are more contented than the people and the more successful the republic is. Kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? I want to read to you. I have a very dear friend of mine. <clears throat> How many of you know Tom Deweese? You heard of him? A few of you have. I have had the honor of being asked to be one of the featured speakers at the International Symposium on Land Rights in, in Ontario, Canada on the 4th of October. That's an international event. I'd like to invite every one of you. It's on the 4th of October. And uh, if you're interested, uh, I'll get it direct, uh, the uh, location and time and whatever. But for you folks who are really interested in this land rights thing, I'm working with some people up there Crackerjack people, sharp, sharp at this pattern. Stuff. One of the gals in the name of uh, uh, Marshall. Boy, that gal, she's uh, pretty special. We share information back and forth, but I've had the honor of being asked to be one of the featured speakers at that event. People from all over the world are going to be there. And going to be a very interesting Australia has a constitution, they have a patent process, Canada does, you know, people from Europe, etc., etc. <clears throat> so I'd like to invite you and encourage you to come and go if you can. I want to read you what Tom Deweese put together, and he allowed me to put it in my book. <clears throat> the title of this is, What Does Private Property Rights Mean? Go to page 47 in your book. You can follow along with me. <clears throat> Page 47, top of the page. <clears throat> I'm going to start down a little bit here at the second paragraph. As the founding father John Adams 
The moment the idea is admitted into society that property is not sacred as the law of God and that there is not a force of law and public justice to protect it, anarchy and tyranny commence. Boy, does that sound familiar? Too bad it does, doesn't it? Okay, let's go on. President Calvin Coolidge said, ultimately, property rights and personal rights are one and the same. And that's true. That comes from this book, the Bible. Okay? Because our right to land ownership is an inalienable right throughout Scripture. Ranch earned property, ranch activist Wayne Hague, if you do not have right, if you don't have the right to own and control property, then you are property. And that's true. That's why the administrative courts and all of this are trying to divest you out of your land and your home. They don't care what it costs you. They don't care how it hurts. They don't care whether your children have a home to go lay and become home at night and have security. A home is a security place, isn't it? It's your sanctuary, or should be. It's what it's intended to be. Are you going to give it up? Are you going to sit there and do nothing about it? It's your choice. Private property means, and I want you to, to follow along with me in it because both of this is important. The owner's exclusive authority determine how property of his or her property is used. That's a property right. And that gets back to your question here, sir, about some of the bullet point issues. And I think this probably answered that as well as I could of anything that I could say. Number two, the owner's peaceful possession, control, and enjoyment of his or her legally granted purchase or dated property or private property. Number three, the owner's ability to make contracts to sell, rent, or to give away all or part of the legally granted purchase deeded private property. The local county, city, state, and federal government are prohibited from exercising eminent domain for the sole purpose of acquiring legally purchased deeded private property so as to resell <clears throat> to a private interest or to generate revenue. Well, we see that all over, don't we? Okay. <clears throat> I want to go back to the top of the page a minute. I saw something that I forgot. Let me read that first. The Fifth Amendment <clears throat> treaties by the Washington State Supreme uh, Court Justice Richard Sanders, <clears throat> and he writes, and I quote, Our state and most other states define property in an extremely broad sense. That definition is as follows. Property is a thing that consists not merely of its ownership and possession, but of its unrestricted right of use. Anybody here in Montana got land use restrictions on your property? Dude, I'm just... Boy, is this thing a lot. <clears throat> but their unrestricted right of use, enjoyment, and disposal Anything that destroys any of the elements of property to that extent destroys the property itself. The substantial value of property lies with its use. You get that? That's why you want to make good benefit and use of your land and your water. If the right of the use is denied, the value of the property is diminished. And the ownership is rendered a barren right. A barren right. What's it mean when something is barren? Doesn't produce anything, does it? And I don't just mean the growth. And you're restricted of your land and like somebody got their hand around your throat. Okay, let's go on to number five, page 48. That no local, county, state, or federal government has the authority to impose directives, ordinances, fees, fines regarding these <clears throat> landscaping, color, selection of trees, 
planning preservations or all of this other stuff, or open space or legally purchased deeded private property. You go to build a house, they want you to put a plan here, they want you to put this over there, put a bunch of garbage. Number six, that no local city, county, or federal government shall implement a land use plan that requires any part of your legal possessed, deeded, or private property to be set aside for public use or for natural resource protection areas, directing that no conservation or disturbances may occur. Boy, we see that, don't we? Number seven, that no local city, county, state, or federal government shall implement a law or ordinance restricting the number of dwellings that may be placed on the legally purchased deeded property, private property. Number eight, that no uh, local city, county, state, or federal government shall alter the imposed zoning restrictions or restrictions that will devalue or limit the ability to sell legally purchased deeded private property. Number 10, that no local city, county, or federal government representative <clears throat> or their assigned agents may, may enter private property without written permission to the property owner or as to the possession of an unlawful warrant from a legit, <clears throat> legitimate court of law. This includes invasion of private rights and privacy <clears throat> by government use is un man drone flights. You realize your property goes up in the air? I don't know if you knew that. I want to mention anything that has to do with water on your land. It could be a drill well, a spring, artesian, pond, belongs to you. A lot of the states now want to try to have uh, permits for your well. Don't ever do that. Whatever you do, don't give up your water. Oh. Yes. Some of the well drillers won't, won't drill a well because they think you have to have a permit. Well, well find there's a way around that. Okay. What about rainwater? Well, I'm not talking so much about the permit of the drilling, but I'm talking about more of the monitoring your wells after they're drilled. Well, I know what uh, I talked to people in the state of Washington. They own a piece of property. They will not let them drill a well there. So there's no water. They can only live on their property four months out of the year. Well, they need to stand up and do something about that, Heather. Oh, that illustrates my point. We claim we're free, and yet we're allowing all of this stuff to choke us and choke us and choke us and choke us. <coughs> Which are you, a king or you a slave? Case in point, at the bottom of page 48, neither a town nor its officers have any right to appropriately <coughs> or interfere <coughs> excuse me, with private property. Vince Mitchell versus City of Rockland. Brings up another question. How about all these covenants that you're supposed to sign before you can buy a property that's, 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 that's not done by the city or thing, but some kind of a, a, a board of a subdivision or something? Homeowners association. I personally have been involved in a very similar situation. And we got together and we went and we bought a drill rig ourselves. We drilled our own well, put our own casing in. That ended the argument. There's an old saying, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is for permission. Okay? Yep. Well, they want to tell you you can't park a car in your driveway. They want to tell you, you know, the... What, what did you just read? Yeah. Don't live there. Are you going to surrender voluntarily to that? You're only subject to that if you yield to it. Well, they, they make, I guess they make you sign an agreement before they sell you the property. Don't buy there. Well, don't buy it. Don't if, buy it. if that's a term and condition, I would say you keep your property. Because with restriction on it, you have no property. You may have a dwelling place, but you have no property. Because then you are property. <coughs> All right, I want to skip over to 
page 115. We're going to get into the patent issue. A lot of you are curious about that, and rightfully so. <clears throat> Page 115, steps to your land patent. The first thing that you need to do is to get a copy or pull your copy or wherever your copy is. But in addition, you get a certified copy out of the county recorder's office as of your warranty deed. The reason for that 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 has your meets and bounds on it. It has your name as the purchaser, <coughs> and it has the land description and the date at which you purchased it. Comes into play in your chain of title. <coughs> okay? The second thing that you do once you've acquired that, you get a complete certified copy. Now, I'm going to stop you here for a minute. I get hit up with the question all the time, do I have to get it certified? Do I have to get the whole chain of title? The answer is equivocally <clears throat> and absolutely. And I'll tell you why in a bit. Best insurance you'll ever get. You get a certified copy of your buy-sell agreement out of the county record. With the stamp on it, certified. Must be certified. Once you get that, you look on your document <coughs> and you look, excuse me, <coughs> you locate your meets and bounds. <coughs> meets and bounds is your, your township, your range, and your section, and the identification where your property is located in that section. And it'll be on your, your, your document. Yes, ma'am. Well, it won't necessarily be on your document. I sell real estate, and most of them have been subdivided. They're identified as Rock C, Mountain Myth Subdivision, or whatever. But they probably <laughs> more have a means and bounds. Okay, we're going to go to the county surveyor's office and have him help you get. And thank you for bringing that up. Most of the ones in the past have all had your meets and bounds, and, and she's correct. They've chopped them up so much anymore. You can get your certificate of survey. Sorry. So you just get your certificate of survey. But it's in every report, it's in all the reporters offices. But it doesn't have- Yeah, it, it may not have <clears throat> uh, the official meets and bounds. You have to have meets and bounds. And the reason for that is, that's what's a record in the BLM offices where you go get your copy of your certified patent. <coughs> yes. These are also referred to as Eloqua. Pardon? Eloqua. Eloqua. Section 31, Township 23 North Range, 18 West. They, they also refer to them as Eloqua. Okay. L -I -C -O -T -S. Yeah. So, I've never seen it. <laughs> to me, That's what it's called, this like, meets and bounds. In the old surveyor. <laughs> but it gives us this. in other words what we're after here folks you're trying to identify where your particular piece of property fits within the original land bed and we call it meets and bounds but <clears throat> your land surveyor can help you do that but most of the time you'll find it in your chain of title too, because like she mentioned there, and she's correct, <coughs> that at least before they started changing that, you'll find out. You'll need that meets and bounds to get a hold of the Bureau of Land Management, the main office in your state, and request three certified copies, three certified copies of the original land patent that affects your land. Yes, sir. You also see that SDR section township range abbreviated that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I don't know what they are in Montana, but in the state of Oregon, I think they're two dollars and fifty cents a piece. Get them certified, and I'll get into why. 
Okay? Once you receive that, your copies of the three copies of the certified plan patent, you now either have a number of options. You either want to go to the county recorder's office, some of it you can do online, and you being in real estate, I don't know how much uh, in-depth information or how far back you can go to research the chain of title or abstract of title. <clears throat> you must be a named owner by virtue of the document that you have that shows that you are entitled and in, at the end of the chain of title as a present to bring your land patent forward. You have to be a land owner, a property owner. It's a requirement. <clears throat> okay? Once you receive that document and you go to the county recorder's office, you can hire people who do that kind of research. The title companies will do it usually for a fee. But you want to get what's called an extensive chain of title or a complete chain of title. All the way from the patent and here's how you verify it. When you get that document by whoever has done the research, compare it with your land patent relative to the meets and bounds. They don't have all of this new stuff on that document. Those are archive records. So they're going to have to have your meets and bounds in order to go to the record, the archive record, and pull your document that's applicable to your land. Are you with me so far? If I'm not, stop me, because it's important that you understand the sequence of events and the number and the items that need to be done. Am I making myself clear? Okay. Don't be afraid to speak up. You don't hurt my feelings. So I don't want to assume that you understand or know if you don't, and there's no embarrassment if you don't speak up. <clears throat> Those documents that you have, if you're paying somebody to do it, if you're paying a title company to do it, make sure, emphasize verbally and in writing that you want them all certified. You say, oh, it costs the money. Yeah, it does. But if you ever get a challenge against you, I'm going to tell you what happens. The reason that you get certified documents, let's just say that these folks here have done their land patent, and I come along and I say, I'm going to challenge this. You know what responsibility falls on me to challenge their land patent document? Yeah. She'll understand this because she's in the real estate business, and maybe some of you else will. I now would have the burden of disqualifying every single certified agent who certified those documents before I can ever touch the document or attempt to touch the document. That's the power of the certification of those documents. It's the best insurance that you can possibly have when you're bringing a land patent forward. Get them certified. Yes, sir. You need to make a point as well that you need to have it certified the, the, the day that you take it out of the record or the copy or the day that you make the copy and you can't make copies of all your uh your chain of title but come back some other day and get it certified you have to get it certified that day i'm not i have a little hearing problem what i'm understanding you to say that you had to get them certified that day? Get, them, sir, get the copies that you get of your chain of title. Get them certified that day. Yes, yes. Don't good, back, good point. Don't come back later. And That's back correct. And certified later. You want that to be certified before you take possession of it. That way there's no question. I don't have anything to do with it. This lady or man, they're the ones qualified and, and have authority to certify it. If I'm going to come and challenge your land patent, I have to destroy every single certification, <coughs> including the BLM and the original land patent. You with me? 
like your children. You talk about insurance, folks. When you're talking about a piece of property that's 200,000, 300,000, a million, whatever the number is, pretty good insurance for two or three hundred dollars to spend on certification of those documents. I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you do that. In the 45 years that I've done this, I've only seen two challenges. Neither one of them prevail, and guess why? Absolutely. They were all certified. And the court said, where's your standing to challenge the certification? See, any issue in court can be addressed upon a debate. It's called discretion. <clears throat> you want to reach up and you want to take away that court's discretion. And how you take it away is that this is certified. See the stamp? Because here's the problem with me, the pursuer, after your property. I don't have anything that's certified relative to the chain of title in most instances. And I've seen that attempted twice, and both times. The moving party lost. Judge threw them out to get out of here. Pretty good insurance, folks. Okay? Once you have that, those certified documents, You only need to get, by the way, one full copy of your chain of title certified. Once you have your complete sandwich done, and we'll get into that in a minute, you need to make three separate copies plus the original. And it's only for safekeeping. The original is not what you post once it's done, and I'm getting a little ahead of it here. But <clears throat> When you go to post this in a public place, a courthouse, a fire station, library, wherever you're going to post it, do a true copy. Do not post the original. When you go to record it after the 61-day period, you must take the original because they will give that back to you. Now, we've had a lot of problems throughout the western United States, in fact, all over the United States, in certain instances of the recorder not wanting to record it. I got a whole deal of law here that requires them to record it. And we'll get into that afterwards here. Are you with me this far? Am I losing anybody about? Yes, ma'am. When you say post the chain of title. Hang on a second. <clears throat> when you say post the chain of title. Are you talking about just the summary of chain of title or each, all the documents? No, you have a good question. Her question was, do you have to have this to summary? You will make a summary from your chain of title. And I show that, and you'll see it in my documents here in a minute. But you want to have the total, complete enchilada, if I can put it in that term. That way, there's nothing missing. Nobody can say, hey, you got an incomplete file. Now you intend to commit fraud. You see how the how attorneys work and devious people, you want, and boy, you understand that point well. The documents get used against you. Exactly. So you don't want to have anything missing. Do not alter those documents. You leave them as you receive them in the certified. But you want to go through them and make sure that they're complete, and especially the certified copy out of the county of your original purchase agreement. You with me? Make sure that that is copathetic, page by page, line by line, etc. Yes. On a certification, who certifies and what type of certification are you speaking of? Just the certification that the county recorder's office gives. It's all that you need. But it did, they'll stamp it. Normally they'll use a well different places. You different. Some just put an ink stamp. Some of them use them in whatever that embossing or whatever that. The imprint on it. The BLM will send you a document, at least they do from Oregon, the Portland office. They'll encrypt that 
there, and then they will stamp it on the back. So when you get it, look front and back to see what has been done with it. Yes. If your meets and bounds are Speak different, up, please. if your meets and bounds are different, what document do you refer to as the one to go off of? It, I'm not sure <clears throat> what you mean by that. The meets and bounds will differ. Well, you made the, you made the point in here that um, I can find it. You have to make sure that they are all the descriptions are the same. That is correct. And if they're not the same, what happens? You go back to again. It, it depends upon whether you're looking at your document of your original purchase or whether you're looking at a certified copy. You've got to backtrack to find out why there's a discrepancy. And there are errors in that stuff too. Okay? And so you go to the earliest document for the most correct. accurate. That is correct. Right. Now, let me mention something in addition to that point. The whole basis of bringing your land patent forward is contingent upon that BLM reference to the meets and bounds. That is not going to change. You can't change it, I can't change it, and it will not be changed. So whatever that meets and bounds is, that's the framework you got to work with. Yes? I was just going to put a comment. We're in the land search business. I do... Uh, Need to speak up so I can hear you. We do land and mineral search. We've been, we've been running title for quite a number of years. If your meets and bounds are different, and they are different, you're on the wrong property. That It could not be an error. Yeah. And it's just quite common in some areas, especially with the lady said over there with subdivision and stuff. Or right. or stuff. You may be on the wrong property. In other words, the document you, document you have is not yours. And that's why it's important, and he has a very valid point. Check that stuff out, item by item. Take pains to research and read it carefully, yes. What happens if a property has been subdivided since the package, and you're only doing, a, like if it was 160 acres and you're only dealing with 20? But you can still go back and determine where in that, whatever that piece of down was, where this subdivision portion is. And I deal with a lot of that. Okay. And people want to add the, the tax lot for the sake of getting the patent from the Bureau of Land Management. It's irrelevant. That patent didn't know anything about a subdivision. Okay? Right, but if, but if but your name wouldn't be attached. Like if you're out talking about a, a portion of the subdivision, your name's not going to be attached to that whole subdivision. It's only going to be your portion that is correct. on the BLM records, and they won't have that. All the parcels. But that doesn't them. affect what you require and are asking of the BLM. It's irrelevant. Because what's relevant is the meets and bounds when they issued that land patent. And See, we want to. I'm sorry. You're within that, that is correct. That's why you. Exactly. That's why you need to know where you're located at. Because if you post this document on the board and you claim somebody else's land, there are people going to jail for that. These documents are legal documents, folks, and they need to be done correctly. Yes. Is it going to matter if in your chain of title or your land is on a government lot? What's considered a government lot? No. Yes, ma'am. Would it involve a, a survey, or should you have it surveyed to be sure that it's accurate? <laughs> a number of people have done that because there has been some confusion about it. But the, whoever does the survey needs to go back to the county survey records and make sure, because we used to do everything by the tripod and the, and the transit and whatever. A lot of the stuff now is done with GPS, and there are some variances in that. And people like this lady up here that deal in real estate, you find that quite often because the land descriptions would go down to the very foot. Yes. What does government lot mean that Senator Fielder brought up? The government lot? Well, the governments have land holdings in different locations for proposed arsenals, for proposed post office, or for, you know, whatever, who knows, whatever. <coughs> so, yes, sir. I've been posting. How do you, how, what's the ways you can post them? 
How do you post it? Yeah, you get your package done. I mean, do you advertise it in a newspaper? You can, uh, we'll get into that. So let's hold off on that for the time being. Yes. Uh, my understanding of government lot up in our area was a discrepancy. It wasn't quite 40 acres. It would be 39.5. And so they call it a government lot. And, and there is. Uh, yes. underneath, whatever. Right. But a lot of government lots and stuff were intended for either right away or road or something that they were going to build. A whole lot of things can be involved in that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Ron, I've been doing this for a lot of years. Have you ever seen a land patent sell to a new owner? And what percentage of your experiences have you seen that's going to knock them down? To me, you pack the land, that, that's got to be worth a lot more than a horn's feet. Well, it, it is. There are some drawbacks to a land patent. Not many, but there are some. And it is simply this, and I want to mention, thank you for bringing that up. <clears throat> All of the benefits of a land patent that we pretty much covered, there are some more, and we'll get into that. But the, the negative side, if you want to sell that land patent, then in essence, you, the person buying it, or acquiring it needs to have the cash to pay you because they can't go to a bank and get a finance. A bank will not finance on a land patent. What turns into a warning is I mean, you don't make one spiral for a lender. You could convert it back, but then you lose all of the, the benefit of it. If you're going to look at selling your land and you want somebody, the availability, you have to make the decision, well, do you want to bring the land patent forward? There are a lot of benefits from it, but a bank will not loan. Why not? Why will not a bank loan on a land patent? They can't foreclose. They can't collaterally attack it. They can't even lean it. They can put a lien on the person's signature. But the bank mortgage and your land are not one and the same. Yes? Well, can she have both? A land patent and a warranty deed? No. Because a warranty deed represents a marketable title. And you know what that means in real estate. Something that you're able to sell. And with a land patent, then in essence, technically and lawfully, you can't sell a land patent. You can convey it, you can sell the building on it. Let's say you got a, I'll just pick a number, half a million dollar property. The land you grant, you grant, which means you give it. But you can get your half a million dollars for the, even though they're getting the land. But the legal documents required of that, lawfully, you're not supposed to sell a land back. Yes, I have a follow up question. So let's say I have a piece of farm and I did this land patent deal and I want to sell it to Joe Smith. And Joe Smith, just in the 99% database, can't buy my land with cash. My question is specifically do I need to change my land patent back to a warranty deed or would the title company do that real quick? I mean, yeah, they, they would do it if you give them authorization to do it. But that brings up my question why then? Excuse me, would you go all to the trouble, time, and expense to bring your land back and forward? You're going to turn right around and sell. I understand, but what if it's in, in your investment portfolio and part of your. Income? And you can do that, sure. Just build an outhouse that. on it and sell it for half a million. Remember, <laughs> remember <laughs> that you relinquish all the protective covenants by doing that. But if my database of buyers is really small, I might have to do that. And you might. Yeah. Okay. But again, that's your freedom of choice to do that. But to answer your question, yes. What's the situation? If you have a loan and you bring a patent forward, will it trigger a due on sale clause if you hold a mortgage? A mortgage cannot infringe or collaterally a land patent. Even if it's in place before. Even if it's in place. If you've got a mortgage, you can still do your land patent process. Absolutely. That mortgage, again, is not tied to the land. 
that's what they've been doing, and that's what I'm trying to help you folks understand. There's a severance or the division between the mortgage and its authority and jurisdiction and your right of the land. Under a land ban. If not, then it ties it up because it's in, under, under another jurisdiction. Okay? But a mortgage is nothing but a lien. And I'm going to get into it a little bit today. But let me put it this way. I have challenged and helped people challenge mortgage foreclosure for about seven years now. And in every instance, we have proven that the bank, mortgage company, never loaned you a dime. What did you say, Ron? They never loan you a dime. The mortgage companies, the bank, for 35, almost a little over 40 years, actually, lend their credit. It's unlawful. I've got case law galore. I wish I'd have brought some of it. But I didn't want to get off into the mortgage thing too much because that's a whole subject to tell. They extend you their credit. Your land purchase comes from the power of your signature. We say, well, how does that work? Very simple. When you were born, within seven days of your birth, they, they issue a birth certificate. The original one that's issued is the certificate of live birth. Huh? What are you talking about, Ron? I'm talking about there's been fraud committed upon your mother and your father and against you if you have children. That birth certificate is then sent, the original one, with your parent's signature on it to the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and they hold that. That birth certificate has a number. It's your birth certificate number. Now, your birth certificate number is your Social Security, but it wasn't always that way. The IMF holds that and they monetize it. When you go through a real estate agent or direct purchase, you sign that document of closing, you have a three-day revocation period to withdraw your signature. I think it's the same in Montana, is it? It's not. It's not on a purchase, on a refinance. Pardon? It is not on a purchase, it is on a refinance. Just on a refinance, okay. In Oregon, you have a three-day revocation. In other words, if you sign it today, you can withdraw your signature as long as you do it within three days. Okay? What they do with your signature is they then, on the fourth day, at least from the ones in Oregon and the ones that have a, a, a time period of revocation, they send it to the IMF. The IMF forwards the money out of your account that was established by virtue of your birth certificate. In other words, they've already got paid for your property. I've proven this in court. Numerous other attorneys who represent the clients. We do, when we challenge these types of, of mortgage issues, we do it, and we perform what is called a securitization audit. And what a securitization audit does, it follows your signature from the very document you sign, who it went to, what they did with it to the IMF, and every place when they bundled them up, and the investment groups bought them, they then turn and sell them, or send them, to an underwriter. The underwriter then evaluates them. They then send them to Dun & Bradstreet. Dun & Bradstreet rates them, and then they send them to Wall Street, and they're put on the market. All the time, you're getting a payment book. Fraud. We've proven fraud. It's been proven over and over and over. They never loan you any money. They loan you their credit. I got court cases galore on Yes. That document, the live birth certificate, is usually found at Health and Human Services. Yes. At least in the Midwestern state, yeah. that's where I found it. And it's also found in the Office of Vital Statistics. <laughs> so, but they won't give you the original. They will give you the altered one. And that was the birth certificate, not certificate of live birth. Yes. I'm trying to follow this. Part of it. So why doesn't everybody go to the bank, 
get a warranty deed to a lender, and a few months later, file a patent deed. Because they don't know what it's about. But understand, you don't want to do this for the sake of creating another problem. There's enough misrepresentation out there. What I'm sharing with you, the reason that you want, I'm suggesting, I don't even say that, to bring your land patent forward is to protect the foreclosure possibility on your land. If you leave it in real estate, I guarantee you they're going to take it. Yes. Well, within the bounds of the reservation, the tribe, the federal government, well, the tribal lawsuit that they filed in January claims that there was never anyone who proved up their C patent status so that none of the C patents issued are valid, nor did the Secretary of Interior have rights to issue water rights. So they're saying the Aboriginal title was never broken, and no one has ever brought forward their fee patent. So the land still belongs to the tribe. Well, there are some problems with that, <clears throat> simply because case law shows, and I've researched a lot of that, that there is a statute of limitation to challenge that. And, and we're going to get into that later on this afternoon, hopefully. But to, to address your particular point, once a patent is issued, unless it has a subject to clause of improvement of property, such as you mentioned, then in essence stands forever. If there is that, that reservation, and that's what we call them in patent language, a reservation, then in essence, if they did not improve it. Now, let me give you an example to illustrate your point. In Oregon, we have seven counties that were affected by legislation back in 1937. It's called the ONC Act, Oregon and California. And the purpose for that is we have tremendous timber wealth where I live. And in that, it was determined by Congress if the economy went up or down because those communities and those seven counties were totally dependent upon the timber revenues, okay? And for those of you who work in county government or whatever, understand, well, that's a, a yo-yo line. They implemented an act of Congress called the ONC Act that stated that timber will be harvested to the fullest no matter what the economic condition is. Well, then the environmentalists come along and they say, we got a lizard, we got a spotted owl. Those weren't reasons, they were excuses to strangle the economy of our part of the country and, and yours as well. So we started doing investigation. I was part of the investigative team to determine where the legal standing was. And I met with some timber people by the name of Swansons. They own a mill, in fact, only the one with a few mills left, at a meeting with the county commissioners. And we addressed the issue that by a congressional grant, oh, and the legislation is in fact a grant. Why don't you pursue it on the basis of the grant? And that attorney for uh, Swanson Lumber Company said, wow. And I said, let me back it up. And I pulled out of my file a New Mexico versus United States 1978 case. The Supreme Court said in that case, said that the, the Organic Act in 1897 that established the National Forest were for two reasons. Two. They were for this continual harvest of timber, and it was for the continual supply of water. Two reasons. None of this environmental garbage, the recreation stuff, was not a part of that enactment. <coughs> that's a luxury. That's not a right relative to the organic debt. And when I presented that to that attorney, and I gave him a copy of it, man, I mean, he backed away from the table, and he's going through that like Sherman through Georgia. <laughs> and he said, where did you get this? I said, it's part of my file. He then went and talked to his uh, bosses, the uh, Swanson Group, some brothers, the family-owned timber uh, mill. 
They filed suit and they won. The federal court said that the Bureau of Land Management, you're to start harvesting timber to the full amount under the ONC Act. So now they're getting ready to start harvesting timber. It's throughout our country, or county, yes. Is that ONC Act applicable only to Oregon and California, or is that then brought based over the rest of the state? No, it's only applicable to those seven counties. Seven mm -hmm. counties. Okay. I don't know what Montana has. I haven't done that much research into the timber side of Montana, <clears throat> but uh, the ONC Act was for the purpose of continual harvest of timber so that the tax revenues that would come off that would sustain the counties, that they were resource counties. And it gutted those counties, literally gutted, because then industry wouldn't come in simply because then they wanted to stack all the tax load on the new industry. And they had not county facilities to support the new industry. Ron, you said it was 1978? 1937. 1937. It's called the ONC Act. You can go to the computer, Google it in, you all go it in, whatever. What was that, Organic Act? The Organic Act, 1897. That's what created the National Forest, officially. That only affects Pardon? Are the seven counties or the whole National Forest? Yeah, of all of the National Forest. Yeah. So that would have put in Montana also? No. Yes. The the only the Oregon. Oregon. No, they're they're only the Oregon. It established all of the National Forest. Okay, and then they split them up. The portion, the low level stuff was handled by the Bureau of Land Management. And the certain elevation and above is to be the Department of Agriculture, U.S. Forest Service. Okay? So getting back to the patent issue, once you get those documents, your chain of title, you have your certified copies from the Bureau of Land Management, now we're going to construct the document itself. This is very critical. And I want to take you to that. <clears throat> you go to page 118. And I want you to pay very close attention. And there's a reason for that. Are you all there that are going there? Okay. At the very top, of this document, you want to put the United States of America and in the Republic State of Montana. Okay? Now, notice that the state is in lower K. I didn't make a mistake. I didn't blow it. There's a reason for it. You're talking about a Republic State, not a corporate state. This document refers back to the original patent, which is under constitutional law, which is virtually uh, uh, based upon common law. We're talking about the Republic standing here. And this is one of mine, personally. <clears throat> and I put Ron Gibson, Kara, P.O. Box, da -da, da 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 You put your address in there, Republic, U.S. lowercase, America uppercase. And underneath that, I have non-domestic. Ron, why did you do that? I'll tell you why. You want to be very, very careful and sure that you are not subjecting yourself into administrative jurisdiction. Because if you do, it invalidates this document and it's standing to you carry that land patent forward. Okay? Does everyone understand that? So when you go to do your document or Rex is helping you with it or whatever, you want to make very careful that the items are followed that I've got and then we're going to get into some more items. Somebody held their hand up. Yes? I'm sorry? Yes, you can send it. 
If you put your actual address or post office box, the law says that you have to, to list where your domicile. Domicile can be your workplace, it can be your home, or whatever, or where you get mail. I've had people try to tell me, well, that isn't lawful for you to do it that way. I looked it up, and it is lawful. You have those three options. Okay? <clears throat> do not, do not use a zip code. I'm going to tell you a little story about a zip code. When you use a zip code, you are acknowledging and surrendering your address, home, business, whatever it is, that you are in a federal district. When you do that, all of the government bull stuff that comes out of the northbound steer is subject you to that jurisdiction. I've had people argue, and I wish I'd have brought it, and I don't want to get into it all today, don't have time. Your zip code, you're making acknowledgement that you are under federal jurisdiction. Yes? Would I need to make a declaration of my domicile then? No. I don't want to get into the whole thing about domicile, but, no. you know, because you have you to keep your yourself domicile. out. As long as you don't use capital letters in your name, you can use upper and lower, but that's your Christian name. But you do not use capital letters and do not use a zip code. As far as the name goes, does that apply for if it was an LLP or an LLC? I mean, it's the ownership entity, or does it have to be a personal name? No, it has to be brought forward in your personal name. That has major problems. Yeah. Major yeah. Patents were issued for the individual. For people, not now, for people. <laughs> well, there's a remedy to that. Don't, don't get discouraged. There's a remedy to that. Okay? Quit claiming it to an individual, do your land patent, and then do your conveyance back to the corporation. Of that. That's done all the time. Yes? Are there any other restrictions that you put, you know, so I live at 112 something road or avenue or anything? No, whatever your address is, that works. You'd write out the word right. rather than RD period. Mm -hmm. or okay. Yeah, whatever your address is, that's what it is. But do not use a zip code. Yes? If your land patent has been filed with the, social, or with the uh, zip code, can, and can you correct that and then refile it? Yes. Yes, you can. <clears throat> so you have to post it again and go through all that? No. All you have to is to post this as an amendment to that document. You have to post it on the board for public view, yes. For 61 days? Huh? Yes, yeah, for 60 days. 61. Pardon? Yeah, 61. Yeah, 61 days. Yes, sir. Are you going to return this with that, that kind of address on it without a zip or anything? I'm sorry. Are they going to... Are you going to get this back from them without a zip code and it in that format? That's it doesn't go anywhere, but you pin it up on a board. Oh, you're not going to send this no. to BLN? No, BLN has nothing to do with it. All right. Nothing to do with it. How many places do you have to pin it up? Pardon? How many places do you have to post it? You have to post it for 61 days. Yeah. Oh, in any public building, courthouse, Firehouse, a library, post office, post office. Within your county. Yes, it has to be within your county. What if somebody, whether it be a jungle worker or anything, takes it down prior to the city? We're going to get to that. You very good question. That's why you make multiple copies. Remember? Now remember, we haven't got into it yet, and we're jumping all over here. We're going to make a summary of your chain of title. <clears throat> That's usually a one or two page document. Because whatever you make up in this sandwich, we call it, you're gonna pin that with two pegboard pins onto a bulletin board, okay? So you don't want 50 pounds of paper hanging on two little pins. Won't stay up. Now, to answer your question, again, very good question. If somebody comes along, 
and takes it down, and you want to check on your posting at least one week, once a week. When you go to check, take you a true copy with you to replace it. Now we're going to get into the note that goes on the bottom left-hand corner, and I'll get into that in a minute, that this document is to be posted for a minimum of 61 days. And then you put the starting date, put that date, and then you put the ending date, and put thank you and initial it. And I, what I do is I use, use, either use a 3 by 5 card or a sticky, but the sticky staple it on each 45 degree angle. You put a sticky on there in two days, it'll fall off. Okay? But you're notifying any person looking at that document that that's to be left there and is required to be posted for 61 days. You with me? All right. This is a notice document. <clears throat> you notice underneath my address on domestic, it said notice of. When you have a notice of, it means to everyone concerned. You don't have to put to whom it may concern. This is a notice, because that's what you're posting as a notice. And this is, you're posting a certificate of acceptance of the declaration of land pet. Now, let's address the certificate issue. <clears throat> In law, to bring a land patent forward, you must accept what has already been done. Because the patent's already been done, hasn't it? To bring that forward, you've got to accept the authority and jurisdiction <clears throat> and the right to go along with that. That's what this document does. <clears throat> and you have to do it to all the world in a public notice and a public place. Are you with me thus far? Yes. You can also post it in a newspaper, can't you? Yes, you can. Thank you. You can post it in a newspaper. <clears throat> the disadvantage to putting it in a paper takes quite a bit of space. In other words, you're going to pay to have it. Yes. You have to post it. You only have to post it in a newspaper that prints it. Hang on a second, Rex. The newspaper you post it in must print at least one day a week. If you print, if you post it in the yes. flathead paper, they print every day, and it'll cost you six hundred dollars mm -hmm. for yeah. the sixty-one days. Yeah. So <laughs> in those cases, you're better off to post it. Did you hear what he said? The cost and that it would cost to put it in for the sixty days about six hundred bucks to get it in the newspaper. A daily paper. So, or whatever the cost may be. Yeah, if it's a weekly paper, it's quite a bit less than that. Pardon? If it's a weekly paper, it's only once a week. No. Okay, okay, but whatever, all I'm saying is that whatever it costs, you're going to have to pay for that. When you post it on a bulletin board, it doesn't cost you your time and two pegs and your, your paperwork. Right. So are you suggesting that if you go the newspaper posting route, you have to put every document in this five documents uh, yes. sandwich? You bet. Not just the no. You've got to put it all. Can you shrink it's it? all a legal document. Can you shrink it? Can they be, uh, yeah, <laughs> you can shrink it. Yeah. You're talking about the document with a company by the chain of title. I'm sorry, Megan. The notice accompanied by the chain of title? You have your summary of chain of title. All, all, five all the documents that I have. The summary page or the actual document? No, the summary page. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. you're doing is alluding to that, and then you have another notice page we'll get to. Let's hold off and we'll get to that, and I appreciate the question. But there are certain things that you have to do in sequence. It needs to be in the order that I've shown there for the purpose. That way everything is in sequential order, yes. If you own numerous parcels that are contiguous out of the same general tract or county range section, can you do one posting or do you have to have one for each part? For each individual piece of property has to be done separate. Now, 
there have been instances where people own multiple properties within the same patent boundary. Yeah. And in that case, you use the same patent, but all of your other chain of title and everything has to be separate. Yes? Ron, if you're challenged, uh, how do you prove that you posted and that it was posted? We're going to get into that. I'll show you how to do that and do it effectively. Yes. Well, I'm trying to keep my questions to the end, but I, I was not able to vote two elections on the landowner taxpayer, and uh, my road in, in, in the country didn't have a number, so I used a post office box. They wouldn't let me vote. Yeah. Two, two elections, and that should be my domicile. But I had to have a number on the road, but I translated it to me. I had a tax bill, I had everything in Montana. Uh, if you just put a post on the spot, it doesn't. But all of the time, a post office box is a lawful domicile. For the purpose of this doctrine, this has nothing to do with voting, and I'm not throwing stones there. I'm saying, let's keep apples and apples there, if you understand what I'm saying, okay? <laughs> yes? Do the library and uh, post offices and wherever, is there any problem with posting there? What if a lot of them will tell you, we can't post that. Then what you say, every government office, every one of them, is required by law to have a place to post public notice. If they say we don't have that, we can't do it here, then you ask them politely, then where is the place that I am authorized, where is your place to post a public document? They have to provide it by law. Okay? All right, let's move on. The certificate of acceptance, the land patent has to be accepted. And this is your verification and validation that you are accepting the original land patent. We're on page 118. And that notice is to the whole world. And it shows there the land patent. Do not just put patent. Do not put just patent. And the reason, there are all kinds of patent. But land patent is specific to the subject matter. Make sense? Okay. You list the patent number. Now I want to go back to something that I neglected to say. The patents certified copies that you will receive from the Bureau of Land Management sometimes are not clear. When you contact them to get your copy of the land patent, the original certified land patent, ask them to please make it for you as clear as they can. A number of people have brought land patents to me and the number is blurred out or not copied. I gotta sit down and make a <clears throat> And <clears throat> therefore, on that basis, if you get a copy like that, call the Bureau of Land Management Archive Records Division and say, would you please verify the number and would you send me another one with the number? They can put the number on it, you cannot. That land patent number is absolutely essential to your document and to your authenticity of what you're doing, yes. I had a request of that sort of the BLM and Billings, and they said, no, if we put it in the marketing plan, it won't be a, a copy. They refused to do it. That, that, that way I got the patent for the good reason patent. I looked at that and I told him, hey, you sent me the patent, but I didn't get any patent number. Oh, you did? Well, what's the you know, legal description to get it to work? And they ran off another copy, and what do we know? We're going to use it. Did it have the number? Yeah. Okay. But in Portland, Oregon, they will tell you that you can't put the number, but they can. Because they're the they're what's called in law the custodial uh, custodians of the archive records. That gives them certain privileges that they can do. And that's for authenticating documents. If the number on that land patent is not in fact clear, 
then they have the authority in which to verify and approve that it is, or to send you, in the case that you just mentioned, to send you one with a clear number. So to alleviate that delay, tell them up front, please make sure that the signature and the dates on the patent are two critical elements, okay, and the land patent number, because your whole document is predicated upon that identification of that number. <clears throat> you put the date of the land patent, mine was dated August 20th, 1866, and that's the attached. That means at the end of my document, there it is right there, I got the land patent. Okay, next item down. Knowing all you men and women by these present. You're addressing everybody, in other words. I, Ron Gibson, do hereby certify and declare that I am an assignee in the land patent named above and numbered above, and that I have brought up the land patent in my name <clears throat> as it pertains to the land described below and the character <clears throat> uh, of the said land so claimed by. Uh, the patent and legally described and referenced under the patent number listed above is da -da 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 -da, Township 37 Pound, Range 1 West, Southern Florida, uh, Section 9, Willamette Meridian, uh, Oregon, containing 320 acres. See attached. And in my document, I have the attached. Okay? Number two, I, Ron Gibson, uh, in domicile appeal box, da -da 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 -da, Rome River, Oregon, Republic U.S., lowercase, capital A, non-domestic. Unless otherwise stated, I have individual knowledge of the matters contained in this certification and acceptance of declaration of patent. Land patent or patent? Is land patent? Should be land patent. Okay. Yeah. Insert land patent. I didn't do it on this one, but all the ones since I've done. Okay. I am fully competent to testify with respect to these matters. You're saying, well, why is that in there? That's in there because it shows that you are, number one, competent to do this document. See, so there's a problem in law of doing documents from incompetent people. You're proving here that you're competent. And who better to say that you're competent than you? Okay. <laughs> like the guy said, well, I just want to let everybody know I'm perfect. I don't know where you stand. But <laughs> okay. Number three. I, Ron Gibson, an assignee at law and in a bona fide subsequent purchaser by contract a certainly legally described portion of land patent under the original comma certified land patent and I refer to the number. I am being very specific here about what I'm talking about. So that nobody can come along and say, well, you didn't have to really describe it. And that happens. So you want to make sure that you properly identify what it is you're talking about and referring to. Very important. Ron, okay? Ron are you saying I am an assignee at law because you're an attorney, or is that what we all put? That's what you all say. Okay. You're, what you're doing is in law. Okay. okay. What you're doing relative to this is lawful. Gotcha. And you're just stating that. Okay. The only thing you change, or I would recommend that you change, is your particular land description, your patent number, your domicile, your name, that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Dated August 20th, 1866, would do the authorized and to be executed in pursuant of the supremacy of treaty law. Why do you suppose I put treaty law there? 
That's where the authority and jurisdiction came from for the patent, isn't it? Now, here's what's interesting about that, folks. If you've got reference to the treaty, who and how are they going to defeat the treaty? That's why it's in there. This is an insurance policy, if I can put it in that context. You want to make sure that all of your ducks are in a row. Just in case. I have a saying called the 5P principle. Proper planning prevents poor performance. Okay? Do take the time. Use mine as a copy or have Rex help you with it. But you want to do these right. Yes? Um, using old language like that, basically, in a sense, you're saying it protects us from any new language coming. That is correct. Okay. That's, that's exactly what it does. Okay? Okay, the treaty of law, <clears throat> citation and constitutional mandate. Why did I mention that? It's mandated. Or are the patents, by what authority are the patent issued? By the Constitution in it. Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2. Herein, reference were <clears throat> whereupon a duly Authenticated, true, and correct lawful description. That's why your meets and bounds is important, folks. You want to be correct and accurate of your land description. I have read cases where people have done it wrong, some by accident. They got out of it, but they were charged with criminal theft of land. One lady in California was doing this to other people's land and trying to take their by using this process. And it got the land patent process a real black eye by one woman who wanted to be a horse and behind it. A crook, if you please. There's a moral obligation here as well as a legal one, is what I'm trying to tell you. Okay. Together with all the hereditaments, uh, tenements, preemptive rights, Appertents thereto and lawful and valuable consideration which is <clears throat> appended hereto and made a part of this notice a certificate of acceptance and declaration of land patent. See attached again. I did this so I want everybody to know I know what I'm talking about and I can prove it. Go <laughs> see my attached document. Okay? Because you can't put the land patent on this document, so just use the attached. Yes? Uh, why are your mineral rights? Would you want, not want to make the note? Hang on a moment. Okay, what about your mineral estate? It came down with the patent. I'm sorry, say again, I'm sorry. The mineral estate. Okay. If it's still attached to your land, it came down from the land patent. If there is a mineral estate, it will stay so on your land patent, and it will be signified by subject to about three quarters of the way down in your land patent. And I'll read one to you later. But if it has been severed from the land, then it's the land patent. It doesn't change the process of the land patent because then you're dealing with only a surface estate. Well, okay? but sometimes like 50% of your mineral rights, has, like I've seen many instances where uh, the land bank foreclosed on farms and then they sell the farms at a sale and they keep the mineral right. But I'm not sure of your question. Okay, if you want to protect those mineral rights, would you include that in your... Then statement? you do a separate filing on it and they can't sell it, they can't take it. Separate. And that's the reason, but then there's a lot of case law on that very point. Thank you for being patient with me. I had some damage from Vietnam and I had some kind of hard time here. But that is a separate estate if there's mineral on your property that was segregated out in the patent. If you have a patent and they later found, that's what I referred to earlier as the noble decision. Okay? But you document that. I've owned my own property, a file for the minerals underneath the land that I already owned. But it was a separate estate. 
So that's calling the Homestead certificate that I got, the patent. So I just went, filled out my paperwork, filed it with the county, sent it to the BLM, got an ORMC number on it. Now I own the memo. They can't come and take the memo. And I had a dominant right. Yes. Is there a way that all of these are done left on the United States and everybody in this room can form a coalition? But they come after one, they gotta come after us all. No, because they're individual. In other words, you could form a co-op for the sake of trying to protect each one, but the challenge could never be against all of them. No, not the challenge, but everybody jumps into the courtroom and, and fights. That, well, certainly. If enough people went into the court, and you bring up a good point. You know, when you got a neighbor, a friend, a relative going to court, get your hind end out of your chair and go and pack that courthouse. Now, I'll tell you what that does. I had a judge tell me, a judge told me that. He said, you know, he said, of anything that us judge fears, he said, it's a mass of the public. And I said, why is that? He said, because I got an election coming up pretty quick. I got an election coming up. Okay? Exactly. Exactly. They're afraid that enough people see the horse crap they're doing, they'll vote them out of office. If you want your party to win, you pack that courtroom. That isn't good enough, and you put an article in the paper. In our county, we ran a judge clear out of the county, lost the judgeship and the whole thing, because he was horsing around and stomping on people's rights, and we said, that's it. And the people rose up like the Bundy issue. They fear you and I people in numbers. They fear you. And especially if you're knowledgeable and know what you're talking about. Knowledge is power. Okay? <clears throat> and I'm going to move on, but use this as a guide. If you have any questions, Rex can help you. We're marked along in our time here. Need to take a break here in a little bit. Can I ask about maybe a typo that might be in there? Pardon? There might be a typo in number five. Two of them. Just wondering. In the middle line, it says equitable interest on any in. Is there a word missing? Yes, it is. Thank you. What's missing? <laughs> it should be in. A court of law. Equitable interest in a court of law. So we are to strike out on any? Yes. So not law, but but uh, interest in, block out on any. And then the, the number is supposed to be 60? Yes. This is not the original one I did. This was my worksheet. And when I put it together, I used the wrong one. So, yes. Yeah, number four, you, you say, I have assigned the entire tract. But in a lot of cases, you would say, the portsman of that tract. You wouldn't have the whole thing like that. No, at the beginning, he puts no claim. And the first word that he does not claim all of it. I have been assigned the entire tract of land. No claim described no claim. in the original patent, though. No claim, no claim is made that he claims it. Read the first no. couple words. Okay. Oh. Right. Okay. Go on through number six from the lawful, lawfully qualified sovereign, American individual, has a claim to title. This challenge the court of competent, original, and exclusive jurisdiction. That is such a critical statement, folks, because most courts are not courts of competent jurisdiction. And if you're going to be challenged, or if you are challenged, 
You need to challenge the moving party by virtue of their standing to bring the suit, number one. And number two, you challenge the jurisdiction of the court that they are not a court of competent jurisdiction. Because you don't have a court here locally, a court of competent jurisdiction. If you're confident about winning your case, then in essence you can instruct the judge that in fact he can rule in favor of your patent, but he can't rule against it. They hate to hear that. They want to have the power. Tragic what happens in our courtrooms. Okay? Exclusive jurisdiction in the common law Supreme Court, Article 3. When you see Article 3 of a court, that means it's a constitutional court. Okay? Number seven, therefore the said land remain unencumbered, free and clear, and without liens or lawfully attached in any way, and is hereby declared to be a private land and private property, not subject to any commercial forms, i.e. or e.g. UCC, in other words, Uniform Commercial Code. In other words, you're saying you're not in commerce. That falls under administrative jurisdiction. You're under common law. Your statement for the record, whatsoever. Number eight, a common law of courtesy of 60 days is stipulated for any challenge or two, otherwise latches and estoppel shall forever bar the same against said allodial. Remember our allodial? What does that mean? You're king of your land, aren't you? Owing to no one. Freehold estate, assessment being therefore, and to the contrary, notwithstanding. Therefore, declaration after the 60 days from this, from the date, if no challenge are brought forth and upheld, <coughs> perfects <coughs> this allodial title in the name or names forever. Northwest Liberty News, picking the lock on the shackles of tyranny. Okay, thank you. All right. We're back to the page 119. Uh, you notice that I addressed the issue of different jurisdictions having to do with your land patent documents. Uh, those are kind of self-explanatory. And then the last paragraph on there is additional uh, lawful authority having to do uh, with your rights and entitlement having to do with your land patent. On page 120, your document, when you complete this, do not, do not have it notarized. You're saying, why not? Because notarized documents came in after the issuance of the land patent under common law. You have three witnesses, and we used to use only two witnesses. But I found a case, and this was really kind of my preference, and I'll tell you why. Two witnesses in testimony is about equal, not supposed to be, but the court's considered about equal with the testimony of a notary. I read several court cases that said three witnesses supersedes the, te the, the testimony of a notary. In other words, the notary says, no, this is this, and three witnesses testify to the contrary. The courts are bound to, to take the credence of the three witnesses, okay? So that's the reason that I put three, yes. And you said the notarization is a post-patent practice, post, that is after patent, post-patent practice, it's, it's notarization, that came into practice after land. That's correct. Okay, so that's why we don't do that. But also, the court cases have stated that the courts consider three witnesses to be superior to a notary. And a notary is a state agent. And does the state have any authority or jurisdiction in your land patent? No. No, they don't. Okay? 
So you see kind of why we do what we do. The reason being you want this thing to be as secure and correct and accurate and moral as you possibly can make it. Yes, sir. We have security and authenticity. What if you choose three witnesses and let's say the government or somebody makes a report on your authenticity, those three witnesses are dead and they can say, wow, I can improve with that signature. Because the witnesses are a matter of record. Okay? That's why we build a, what I call a war chest. That means your record. You get a document in the mail from the Internal Revenue Service or from a state agency or whatever, you want to answer that document. Do not throw it in the trash. The first thing that I recommend, depending upon what it is, and I'm kind of generic in here, but you want to ask first thing, what is your authority to send me this document? Okay? I can tell you a story and I want to make it real short. I had a friend of mine, owns a ranch. The land patent has been land patent since 1847. Before the state of Oregon was even a state, Oregon didn't become a state until 1859. The do gooders of the government decide that the Department of Geology and Mineral Industry is going to come and demand that he get a conditional use permit for a rock pit that had been there for 80 years, way before there even was any regulation having to do with that kind of stuff. And I'm telling them, they came at him like a hungry pack of wolves. Lyle came to me and said, Ron, what do I do? I said, very simple. I said, I'll write a letter for you. You sign it, you send it back. First thing I did, I challenged their authority of which to infringe upon private property. I said, I want it in writing. So they sent me back a bunch of war ass stuff that didn't even have relevance to the subject matter. So I wrote him another one. I said, the documents I received to you from you on such and such a date are, are uh, totally irrelevant and have no bearing on the subject matter at hand. Would you please, uh, once again, request that you provide with the proper authority and jurisdiction? So they fussed around and sent one more document, so I countered that. And then they said, well, now that you don't have a permit, you've got an oversized rock pile. In Oregon, <laughs> in, under administrative law, you can only have 5,000 yards per year that you crush. You've got a rock crusher there, been there forever. And I said, well, that's interesting. So I wrote an affidavit of fact. And I stated to the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries, I said, identified who I was, identified that my family lived up the road there for the last 65 years, and that the very fact that I can personally testify and will testify in a court of law of the fact on behalf of, of Wildwood Talk that in fact that pile of rock is not in excess of 5,000 yards. And I gave them my, my resume. I've been a managed consultant for 19 years of mineral development, rock crushing, and whatever. I've owned rock crushers. I was in the crushing business for about 12 and a half years. I know a pile of rock when I see one. <laughs> and I stated that. And I said, furthermore, I said, here's the problem that you people have from the government. I said, now you're in violation of federal law, Title 18, Section 242, 241 and 242. And I think I addressed that in the book. It's called deprivation of right under color of law. Here a man has a land patent, has had it since 1840, 1842, whatever it was. And they're claiming jurisdiction over something that they have no jurisdiction over. And now they're committing fraud against him by misrepresenting the value and the quantity of his personal property, his rock. And I said, I'm going to testify on his behalf of the criminal activity. And I gave him my background in law. And I said, the other problem that we have here is the very fact that this man has been an outstanding citizen and a contribution to the community for over 80 years. Man was 82 years old. And to me, that's absolutely criminal for an agency to come after a man that has spent his life, paid his taxes, and been a benefit 
to the county, to the state, to the production of food, etc. And I wrote on my document to them, and I said, shame on you. I said, I think I'm going to file criminal charges against you myself. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I mentioned to you, but I'm in the final stages of getting my private attorney general certificate. Congress allows three different departments to litigate court cases. Number one is the United States Attorney General. The second one are the state attorney generals. And the third one is the private attorney general. Attorneys have no standing to lawfully litigate cases in court. And I can prove it. I have the documents. So I have submitted the documents to Washington, D.C., to the Senate Judiciary Committee to receive my certificate for a duly authorized and sanctioned uh, uh, private attorney general. And when I get that, I'm going after some people. <laughs> I am sick to death. I'm sick to death of them taking yeah. unlawful agency positions. And we have, a, we have a need for lawful government, folks. I don't deny that a minute. And I'll support that to the hill. But the moment they start stepping on private property and private rights and start taking rather than being a servant of the people, I'm going to sue them on constructive trust fraud. And what's beautiful about that, their own doings proves their guilt. All I got to do is go to the public record, pull it, get it certified, file my suit as my exhibit. I have won a number of those. And I know how to do it. Yes. Constructive trust fraud. Every elected official is a constructive trust agent. By the very fact of elected by you, the king, for them to be the servant to do your business relative to your government. When they violate that fiduciary, they take the constitutional oath. That constitutional law states that they will uphold the Constitution and protect your rights. I'm paraphrasing here a little bit for the sake of time. And I sue them under constructive trust fraud because what they're doing is fraudulent. And I've got court cases galore. You wouldn't believe my court file. I got warehouses full of court files. I got a computer that's got 31,000 cases on it. In one, I've got 5,300 that I haven't even looked at yet. So I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with the girls that do. But I study. Yes. Um, you've referred to what I've seen as many times the phrase power of law. Yes. You bet. Thank you for asking. The question was would I define what color of law is? I will give you a prime example. <coughs> Driver's license. <coughs> Politicians hate for me to bring this up, and I love it. <clears throat> In other words, a color of law is presented to you, the public, on the basis that this is the law. When, in fact, the law is here. This sounds like, looks like, appears to be, but it's a phony. A counterfeit $100 bill, if I can use the analogy, okay? Under color of law, that's an intent to commit fraud in the first instance. It is committing fraud in the second instance. And it also is a violation of the fact of full disclosure. Full disclosure is a very important term that you need to understand. When you sign a document for a driver's license, the state never, never divulges to you what you're giving up of right in order to receive a permission. That's color of law. You in real estate especially, boy, their disclosure's got to be made about everything in there, or supposed to be. And instead of our people, and that's why our elected officials are so important, you need to get people, and the Bible tells us that we need people with a godly heart. 
The second thing along with the godly heart is people who've read, know, and understand the Constitution. And if we're going to fix this problem that we have in government, we had better pay attention to who we put into office. Thank you very much. It makes me ill to hear some of the justification of some of the people of why they, oh, I like the way he combs his hair, so I'll vote for him. <laughs> but in fact, he sells them out at every vote. <laughs> But color of law simply means that it is not the truth. They're proclaiming it to be the truth, but it's actually an actuality, a misrepresentation of the fact. That's what color of law is. I want you to go, it's in my book, to Title 18, USC stands for United States Code, Section 241 and 242. Okay? Title 18, Section 241 and 242. Did that answer your question? Already. Go to page 121 quickly. These two pages here represent what I did because I acquired my property by virtue of a quick claim deed and not by a land sales contract. What you will put in, in replace of this on yours will be the copy of your warranty deed, just one paper or two at the most, that has your name, the buyer, the date you bought it, and the property description. That's what goes here. Okay? Page 121 and 122. Both of these documents are part of my quick claim deed when I acquired the property. That's what you put there. Yes, sir. Does it matter if the property is in a trust? It depends. The question was, does it matter whether the property is in a trust? It depends upon whether the trust is the owner or the holder of the property. The patent has to be brought forward in the individual's name. It cannot be a trust or color of law. Just so that you know. We use them and in administrative circles, it, it has its function. But in reference to law, L-A-W, it is a color of law. It's used only in an administrative jurisdiction, yes. So if you have an LLC that is owned by you, and you have an adjacent contiguous property that may be your primary residence. That but that's an administrative jurisdiction creation. Well, that works. Well, well even though the LLC is still owned by you. The LLC cannot own a land patent unless it was con acquired from an individual as a patent. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. I just one question on what you said earlier about the three witnesses. Yes. Now, uh, the, I believe the courthouse requires anything to be recorded to be notarized. And I noticed on your example is notarized. Yeah. So. I'm just giving you the example okay. that if you want to have it notarized, it's fine. No, I would rather not, but is it a requirement to have something recorded at the courthouse that it be notarized to be recorded? No. Okay. They may claim it is, but I can tell you that it doesn't. Before they had notaries, everything was witnessed. Yes? Do the witnesses all need to be present at the same time? Can you collect them over time? You can as long as it's stated when they witness. But the problem with that, let me clarify that, they're, you're, they're witnessing your signature. Right. So they need to be there, whatever, right. okay? Yeah, so witnesses need to witness each other as well as you. Right. right. That's the way to properly do it, yes. And non-family members. No, it can be a family member. Family member. There's I someone to prove that you signed that document. Okay. I may have a dumb question, but on this whole document, the first document on page 118, can the margins be changed so that you can fit it like on one piece of paper? 
I'm sorry, say again. Can the, can the margins and things be changed? Any of the spacing so that you can fit it on just the front and the back? Reformat it. Reformat it. Yeah, you can. The only problem with that, when the people go to look at it, it's amazing. We have found how many people look at these documents hung on the bulletin board. Oh. I mean, the pages are torn and fingerprints and lipstick and candy bars and, you know, you hear what I'm saying. And if you're trying to keep that on the board, then when you pull that paper, you're pulling against those pegs. So you should print these on separate well, I would like recommend it. You can do what you want, but yeah, the answer is, but you Not can put it on both sides. Okay. I'm just saying a little more practical if you can lift one page up at a time. Gotcha. Whatever. For the sake of another three or four pages of, of paper. Uh, are, no, this can be done on eight and a half. They're all accepted now, eight and a half left. When you had legal papers before. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Nine point. <laughs> okay, page 123. This is the summary of chain of title. You can do this how you want. Yes, Dick? Uh, yeah, I can do it on 8.5 by 11, but when you go to report, you have formatting requirements placed on, on the document by the report. You have to have the top three inch margin and one inch margin on both sides of the bottom. On the first page. Subsequent pages, you need a one inch margin all the way around. Yeah, well, otherwise, you don't follow that rule, it'll cost you a, an extra 10 bucks. I've not ever had an issue with that, but I appreciate you bringing it up. Page 123. Summary of chain of title. I recommend that you do it like this for several reasons. Number one is the fact it's very easy to read. When you look at that, and you look at my example there, it's very neat and clear to read, isn't it? And that's what you want. The left-hand column is always your seller. Is the seller. The little tiny deal in two says two. In other words, who you're conveying your land to. The middle column is the buyer, the recipient, whatever you want to call it, the grantee. And the right-hand column is the date that that document was executed. Now, this will be difference in number depending upon how many is in your chain of title. Somebody was mentioning there that they only had three. I've seen four pages of this stuff. The, the date it's recorded or the date it's signed? I'm sorry? The date it's recorded or the date it's signed? You want to do it the date on the document that it's signed. Signed, so okay. And the reason for that, it coincides with your paperwork. Okay? The date that it was recorded that can vary and you can chase it all over the place. Okay, any questions on the summary of chain of title? This, by the way, is absolutely required. And you have your documents at home that are all certified in a nice box. You don't want to put them all in the same place. You got a safe deposit box, I would take and put one copy there do not have in the same place. We've had several instances of fire and burglary, and they took all the documents. The fire burnt the place down. Had to start all over. Okay? Proper planning. All right, next page, 125. This is another notice page. This notice page is to anyone attempting or trying to challenge your standing and your land patent. This notice is to form any person who has a lawful standing. Now notice you want to describe what I said here, a lawful standing, not somebody that wants to come and bitch because you're doing what you're doing. OK? 
Okay? Which means they got to bring some valid paperwork to you and say, hey, hey, I'd like to talk to you. Don't be afraid to talk to someone if that's the case. Find out what it is that's going on so that you know. Notice to inform any person who has a lawful standing to view this file and who wishes to review the complete file on record may do so by requesting an appointment. Now, what I'm trying to say in this document, folks, you're in the driver's seat, okay? You're the boss, you're the king, they gotta come to you, yeah. when can we do it? You tell them when, where, what time, da 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 da, -da. They cannot dictate to you because you're the holder of the patent, you're the king. And I list the items that I put in mind. Notice number one, I, Ron Gibson, set the time, date, and place for the review of my documents, no exceptions. I'm not going to let anybody else who doesn't own that's my land that I do to dictate to me what I'm going to do or not do. And I don't say that to be a hard task, so to speak. I say that simply because if you start letting the tail wag the dog, you're going to get in trouble. Yes. I'm sorry. I just have to ask this. I keep talking about the king, but I'm looking at your example of chain of title, like seasons of like Stephen Simone Nick. And I'm only asking this because this is reality. Divorce happens 68% of the time in America. So when you have a little cat and a hundred two names and there's a divorce, you say that you have protection from authority. What happens? The divorce court can't affect that land value. Can't. Cannot. Cannot. Okay. Out of their jurisdiction. What did, what did I share with you about the court of competent jurisdiction? What did I address who has the authority to address a land patent? A divorce court judge has no authority to affect that property. So in your experience of doing this... And I've had cases like that. So what happened? It forces the two people to come to some mutual agreement. So to one, negotiate there you go. Okay. They're the two that entered into that. They're the two that's got to solve it. You keep the courts out of it. And this forces the courts out of it. You hear me? Okay. Before we leave the uh, chain of title, Pardon? Before we leave the chain of title, um, I know we have. Um, so you go to the title company and they do the research, you pay them 15, 20 bucks for the research, then you rebuild the chain of title like this for your packet. Do you need it certified? Certified. Everything that you get relative to your original package of gathering information needs to be certified from those documents and you create this the title company isn't going to do that no no so this document shows in the package as an uncertified page but you have your title company search elsewhere certified yes okay. yes Okay, and number two, I, Ron Gibson, have the summary, the chain of title included in this file. I'm just reminding everybody that I got my ducks in a row. Okay, I have it. Okay, notice number three, this document is the total of whatever number of pages. And yours will be different than mine, you, in normal court. The reason that you put the number of pages, you are documenting the number of pages in reference to what actually is there. So make sure you do the proper count, okay? <laughs> then somebody can't say, there's a page in this one from here. Irregardless of whether it is or isn't, there's always that. Proper planning prevents poor performance. Put the number of pages in, okay? Then, bottom notice, failure of any lawful party claiming an interest to bring forward a lawful challenge so the lawful challenge. It has to be a lawful challenge. 
In other words, there's got to be some substance to what they bring to, you, to your attention today, and we need to talk about that. Okay? A lawful challenge to this certificate of acceptance or declaration of land patent and the benefit of the original land patent, original land grant, <laughs> forward slash patent, as stipulated herein, will be less and estoppel to any and all parties claiming an interest forever. In other words, you're telling them that unless you come forward in that 60 days with lawful documents after the 61 day period, because you've got the exception of the one day when you first posted, they are forever barred from reasserting a claim against your property. Okay? Yes? Um, two questions. That at the end of your 61 days, they are forever barred. Okay, and then in this paragraph you just read, the word LAT, L A P A T G, what is that? That means that anything that adheres to it, that tries to go on on it, tries to attach to. So it is spelled L A C A T G. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. The legal term is the statute limitation. Pardon? The legal term is statute limitation. Right. Any other questions? Okay. Failure to make a lawful claim indicated here within time. Calendar of the 60 days of this notice will forever bar any claim from any claim against my or our allodial patent estate as described herein and will be final judgment. Period. Okay. The next page on page 20, 126 is the, this is a photograph of my actual path. It's kind of hard to read, but your document will go in place of mine there. Okay? The original. Whatever you, you bet. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you, Ron. Appreciate you all the information. So you got to go pick somebody up at the airport. Yeah. Uh -huh. Those documents that you see on page 118 through 126 are the documents that you put in your land patent sandwich and you go to post it on the bulletin board or whatever comes it really. Is there any question about what we've covered in it? This whole package has to be posted. All of these pages. You're only going to have seven, six, seven, eight, or nine pages as a general rule. Take you some the, the pegboard deal with the little buttons on them, you know, to stick it on the bulletin board. They go in this order? Pardon? They go in this order? Yeah, in this order. How many does it mean to make one good enough? You have to post the office No, you have to just post one in whatever building. Bill there's one other addition that I want you to make note of. Please write this down because I couldn't photocopy it and put it on here. On the very first page of your notice document on page 118, at the very bottom left-hand side, starting from the left one and going inbound, take either a sticky pad, I need to sit down a minute, a sticky pad or a three by five card, and you write on that, this document must be posted for 60 days. You don't have to say 61 on it because you already know that anyway. But put, and underneath that, put the starting date. Write starting date and then 7th of June 2014 to you know, 6th of August. 2014. Yes. So if you go and check it, it's not there, you want to take it down, then. That is correct. How much time wise steps to reach out? I would suggest checking it once a week, is what I recommend. And when you go to check it, take an extra copy with you. The copy that you post on the bulletin board, one other item, at the top right angle, remember, 
you are not posting the original one on the bulletin board. You keep that safe and sound. After the 61 day, then you take that one and you take it to the county recorder to get it recorded. Okay? I'm sorry, what was your question again? Oh, yes. Okay. Take a, a copy at the very top right hand corner of that. Do write true copy and initial it with your initial underneath of it. Okay? If you've got to replace it three times, then have the document that you staple to the bottom of how long it needs to be there and the true copy at the top. Okay? Does that answer your question or? Well, if, if, if you started it and you had it up for two weeks, somebody took it down. Then put another one up. And does it start from it? No, 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 no. Your time is good from the day you post it. Now let's talk about the posting of the document. When you post a document, you take a witness with you. Very, very important. Take your cell phone or a camera, and when that's stuck up there, you take a picture of it. Try to have somebody that will come back with you 61 days later. The same person. When that's completed, then have that witness do an affidavit of fact. On such and such and date, I accompanied Joe Blow to the, you know, Kalispell Courthouse for the purpose of posting an updated uh, land patent that consisted of eight, nine pages on the thing. We arrived at 1026 and we left at 1103 or whatever. Okay? Have the same person come back when you pick it up and state exactly what you did. The time you got there, that the land patent document was removed. If there is a removal of your document, from that board at any time, then you log that. You make note of that. I was here on this date. When you go each week, you write that down in your book. You keep a log of when you posted it. And you keep a log when you went to check it. If you replaced it, you log that down. You keep records. Okay? Any other questions about that? At the end of that 61 day period at any time thereafter you can take it to the county recorder now i want to talk about the county recorder we've had a number of problems with county recorders who refuse to record the documents and i am here to tell you and we will turn to this in just a moment here Turn to page 128. This is important. This document is titled, Patents Entitled to Recording. If you have a county recorder that says, I'm not going to record that, they have now violated federal law. Let me explain something to you. A county recorder is a custodian of land conveyance records. The original person that got the land patent that has affected your property that you're doing was required by patent law. He has to go to the county recorder to get it recorded to complete the process. People think that the patent is, is finalized when it's signed by the president. And I can tell you that that is not the case. The law requires it must be recorded. Yes, ma'am. If it's an, on an Indian reservation. Hang on just a second. If that's on the Indian reservation, that also applies? No, they're a separate, they're a separate nation. <clears throat> Although, I've had some Indian cases. I'm, I, I'm not really sure about that, but I do know that Indian reservations they're, they're, they're under a whole different jurisdiction. But a lot of times they follow the same pattern. Okay? Yes? Well, uh, in this area, the reservation is overlapping several counties. And, and so its boundaries 
are within the county boundaries. So people who are on the reservation with homestead or intending to bring their land taxes forward will go to the county courthouse yes. off of reservation. That is correct. And it's been right. done in Sanders already. That's correct. If, if their property is under the patent and that reservation overlaps it, they would still come to the county recorder's office to record it. That's correct. The county recorder has a fiduciary responsibility by law to record any land conveyance document. They are not allowed by law to interpret law. They can have in-house policy as long as that policy does not violate the law. You, as a landowner and a patent owner, are superior. You're giving instruction to your paid employee, that being servants of the people, to do what you're requesting to do. And the reason that you want to have it recorded, it fulfills the patent law requirement, number one, and number two, it allows people who have an interest to see what the land is or who owns the land or whatever can go to the record. They're public records, okay? So don't let anybody tell you that they, that they are not going to uh, record your document. And I want to get into that. You need to know what you're talking about. The first one I put up there has to do with my own state and the statute requiring land patents to be recorded. Judgment and official grants record ability evidence. The ORS 93.680, and there's more parts of that. In other words, the state statutes require these documents that have to be. So let me ask you a question, the lady that does real estate here. What happens to, so that you share with the people, what happens when you've got a buyer and a seller and the buyer doesn't ever go and record the document? Still in the seller's name? They Bingo. Thank you. <clears throat> See, you authenticate a transaction by recordation. You also authenticate standing relative to that recordation. Now, I want to go on. The following are entitled to recording of the record to deed to the county, that means land patents, etc of which the lands lie, in a like manner with the effective conveyance of land, duly acknowledged, proved, and certified. Why do you suppose we're certifying our document? They cannot be refused lawfully. And we find some county recorders that are in fact doing just that. And we're going to get into the problem that they create for themselves by doing that. Okay? This list that I have, one through uh, number one and A, B, C, and number two, etc., are what the requirements under or the Oregon ORS, and I won't go into those for the sake of time, you can read them, but it, these are required to be recorded. Okay? Failure to do so in further uh, charges under the Tweed and for being doctors. You're saying, well, what's the tweed? Tweed was a, a law, a case, that addressed the issue of recordation. And when they challenged that in that uh, tweed case, the federal court told them, listen, you better figure out that you've got to go back and record these documents because they are lawful land conveyances. Okay? Now, down to the two with. Requirements to record. This is in your book, so you don't know unless you want to make notations of it. Title 18, United States Code, Section 2071. The federal statute said that it is a requirement to record. It's a federal offense. Title 18 is the criminal statute of the federal law. Pretty serious stuff, if you hear what I'm saying. <laughs> and it gives a case, Bifel versus Morton Rubber, 1990 case, not too far back. 
An instrument is deemed in law. Listen to how this is stated. An instrument is deemed in law at the time of its deliverance to the clerk, regardless of whether the instrument is file marked. I want to give you a case in point. I helped a lady down in Placerville, California. Sharp gal. Really got her stuff together. And she got her land patent process and did everything needed to be done. And she said, what do I do now? And I said, take it to the county recorder and get it recorded. And it's pretty, and pretty sharp. She said, well, what if they won't record it? I said, lay it on the counter and do not touch it. Back away from it. Okay? What did I just read you? It's recorded, indeed recorded, the moment you delivered. When you let go of that document on the counter recorder desk, by law, it's recorded. And we're going to get into some law of what happens if they destroy that document or alter it or throw it in the trash or don't record it. Okay? Yes? It's probably good to have a witness with you. Pardon? It's probably good to have a witness with you. Well, she had a witness, and they turned her down anyway. Yep. And then she called me on my cell phone. What do I do? I said, leave it there. Come on home. And we're going to sue those people. It's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, the point that I'm making here, people, I don't like to swing a hatchet at anybody. But when you have public servants that are no longer servants and virtually want to stomp on your throat, it's time to take some action. I'm a Yaqui Indian. If you wonder what Yaquis are, I'm the southern, my family heritage is the southernmost part of the Apache Chiricahua Muscaleros. We love to fight. <laughs> you want to bring an issue up, let's get it on. And I wear that brand all over. When I was in high school, I used to do a, get in a lot of fights. Not of my own doing, my, my buddies drank, and I didn't. When they got their butt kicked, come on, Ron, and I was quite a fighter. I boxed, I uh, got a belt in karate, you know, been years since I've done it. But the point of it is, you want to get in the crap. That's why I guess I do the legal stuff. Maybe God is saying, because of your ability to stand in there and fight, I do what I do. I don't like the fight, but I'm not afraid of the fight either. Okay? Yes, sir, you had a question. Actually, yeah, it was addressed. Okay. I was just going to say, if, if there's a possibility that uh, when you go to the recorder's office and, the, and it's going to be recorded, and he mentioned it, it would be a good idea to have a witness. Absolutely. So that there's somebody to yeah. say that they refused it. Yes. You want to take a witness with you in any of this stuff, and somebody who will write you an affidavit, and you need to ask them that before you take the witness. And we're all done when you do an affidavit of fact. And all that is is their testimony of the fact. Don't put any fluff in it. Don't misrepresent anything. State it like it is. What's wrong with the truth? Yes, sir. Well, this question you get a copy, you get the original, and we keep a copy. I'm sorry, do what again? When you lay it out there and you have it felt, do you give them the, the original copy, the original, or do you give them a copy? No. The originals, it's required that you have to present an original. Blue ink. Blue ink, always sign your documents in blue ink. Put that in notation. Blue ink. Why is that? It identifies the original. When you photocopy it, it's black. Some color photocopy, but they're not authentic. And if the, the recorder's office is dark and paying attention, they don't have to take that, that, that document. Present the original. That's why you have three certified copies of your patent. If they take that or it's damaged or lost or whatever, make your other two copy and put your other patent document with it. But you want the original patent because it has the original certification on it and it's so marked. Then they, that verifies that you brought them certified documents. Now, when you're done, if they go and record it, <coughs> get a certified copy back. Cost you 30 or 40 bucks. You're saying, well, why would you do that when I put a certified copy in? Now, your document is irreputable. It cannot be disputed. And you know it's been reported. Well, put 
puts the county on the hook. They now have to defend you because the authorized person certified your document. Back out. Now you can take this document to court. Somebody wants to foreclose on your property? Got a problem here, people. They got a certified copy. The court has to accept the certified copy. They have to. You see where we're going with this? Proper planning prevents poor performance. Make sure you do what needs to be done. Yes. So you're taking to the recorder your original certified copies of everything, the uh, the the original land patent. You take your sandwich. Okay. Got seven it. or eight pages. And you then, don't take your whole pile that you've got certified. That's kept in a safe place. You're taking your copy. Your, your true copy? No. no. You're making a summary. That's what that summary's for. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to have a foot and a half pile of paper. So, uh, you're taking this, this summary of the, of the transfer. You do those pages between what I mentioned to you at the start. I forget what the page is. The 126. Okay. And, but all of these... The documents. It'll be seven or eight pages. But these are your original documents that you're taking to the recorder? Your yes. original certified. Yes, you make up an original and then you make up a true copy. The true copy goes on the bulletin board, but the true copy is kept safe until that process time, 61 days, is completed. Then you go home and you get your original. You go with your witness to the county recorder. Then would you please record my document? And if they say they don't, then you take copies of what I'm sharing with you here now, and let's go forward with that, to show that they are required by federal law to do the recordation. Right. Down at the bottom, an instrument, as I read on a reading again, an instrument is deemed in law, in law. No way around it. In law. Not at law. In law. Which means that it's lawful. Filed at the time it is delivered to the clerk, regardless of whether the instrument is file marked. That's what your witness is going to testify. Joe Blow put it on the counter, and the counter recorder said they're not going to file it. But I witnessed that it was placed there relative. And you quote this case and this, this uh, statute here, Title 18, section, section 2071. Yes? How can you tell if they actually do document it? You have to stand and watch? To, uh, what, what, how can you have proof that they have actually done it? Oh, they give you a reception oh, number. How do they confirm that they have documented it? You stand there and watch them, or what? what no, they'll usually take it back to the room where they do that to their photocopy, and then they'll photocopy every page, and then they'll stamp. And then you have something in your hand, and then they'll give it back to you, or they'll mail it back, okay. whichever the case is. Okay. And in our counties, they give it back. They ask you to wait, and it'll take them five minutes. And then they'll take it back and they'll put it through the photocopier in the same pattern that you present it. That's why it's important to present it. Because now the first page on that is your notice of your certificate of acceptance and declaration. And if they mail it, how much time would you give them to get it back to you? Well, you get it back probably in a week. If it's over three weeks, I'd okay. say, hey, that's why you take your witness. We brought a document in here and you said you'd mail it. Yeah, yes, sir. Oh, I was going to where in our county they'll do it right on the spot and they'll put a, a, a reception exactly. number, the date, the time, exactly. the pages, the and book, and the it. page, and who did it, and they give it right there. Exactly. The longest oh. I've ever been is 20 minutes, and that's because something else came up. Yeah. There's some inconsistency then in Montana because I've had to wait more than a couple of weeks for a return, and I called to find out what the delay was. Oh, the uh, state office in Helena is um, sl slow staffed and they're micro fishing things. So it'll take, and, and then soon after that, it was returned to us. So uh, we got a kind of a, a 
chuckle around. Well, a little bit and it's always subject to extenuating circumstances. But uh, what I'm saying is, you know, it's not always on because they were blaming it on Helena's microfiche slowdown. Yeah. So they're putting things on microfiche in Helena. Hmm. You know, you run into situations that don't get exact time frames that we'd like. Hang on just a second. Yes. Well, Ron, just to clarify, you're saying that even if the county records and hands you back your original, you still want to get a certified copy? Yes. Before they give it back, ask them. Now, they will go to their file. They won't certify the one you hand them. They will, you'll have to pay for another document. They'll photocopy it out of their file, certify it, and give it back. Ask for that before you receive the original back. Well, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. But what you're going to walk away with then is, is two documents. The one you presented that they got registered, uh, recorded, not registered. That's another thing I almost forgot. You had a question, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mine's a little off the Never. Never. Never register your land. Record it. You're saying, why is that? When you register your land, you're just giving it away. There are, in law, when you register land, you are conveying that to the county. The county takes it, that as a conveyance from them, from you to the state. All you want is that land recorded, not registered. And I got court cases on it. I do not know where it all derived from originally. I just found it in my research. But it was very explicit in the writer of this thing that said, do not register your land. Let me give you an example. Be with you just a moment now. What do you do when you buy a vehicle? What do you have to do? Register. Guess who owns the title? The state. When you buy a brand new vehicle, there's a, a document that a company from, from Detroit or Japan or whatever it's called the Manufacturer of Origin. When you go and buy a new car and you sign it, they don't give you that. That's the true title. They send in the state. They just rob you of your, of your title, your true title. <laughs> So they give you a certificate of title, which is color of title. All you have is usage of that. I know a guy who was suing the state for unpaid driver's wages. <laughs> oh, he is. And I think that he'll win. I mean, the court's going to win up. And then go for a spot. And the reason that he's doing it, he got a citation. He said, I'm not a corporate, and he wasn't even guilty of it, but he got it anyway. But, <clears throat> so, he decided then, well, I'm not the corporate. So when he made that known, the judge said that his, corp or his uh, corporate capital letter deal stood. He hadn't done the proper paperwork to disfund that assumption of a corporate entity. So then he said, okay, and on the, on the court record, he said, your honor, he said, what you're telling me is that the state owns the vehicle, I'm just the driver. Is that correct? Because that's what I got cited for. And the court said, that's correct. He said, thank you. So he went out, filed a lawsuit for unpaid wages since he was 16 years old. About eight hundred and I forget what the number. It's over eight hundred thousand dollars. He said, "If you're going to claim that I'm a driver, because in law, driver has significant, and I put some of this in my book. Driver is specific to commerce. In other words, if you're a driver, you're driving for hire. You're getting paid, and you have to be hauling a commercial product for hire." That's the legal definition of a driver. You have an inalienable right, the right of travel. God said that's your right from God Almighty. You can go anywhere you want to go without a driver's license, without insurance, and all of that other garbage. But we 
get to here. I'll get a ticket. Let them come and take my car. They don't even want me in their courtrooms anymore. <laughs> they don't. Judge told me, get out of here. Case dismissed. <laughs> Had a guy call in front of me a year ago. March. T-boned him. Totaled my vehicle. Totaled his. He ran a stop letter and stop light. So the officer shows up to investigate. Do you have a driver license? I said, no, I'm a driver license. Wrote me a citation for driving without a license. I said, that's okay. So as soon as they got the ticket on the thing, they got little machines. Now they print out your capital letter name. <clears throat> so they printed out my name wrong, Clinton Gibson, da 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 And so first thing I did, I sat down and I said, I do not consent to these proceedings. I do not consent to entering into a contract with the state, and therefore I'm not a corporate subject. I perhaps am the only person that I'm aware of, and I don't say that to be tooting my horn. In law, we claim you can't prove a negative. I can. In this instance, I went to the Secretary of State Corporations Division uh, website to where the registered names, corporate names are registered, and I went down to the G's. And when I got to the G's, then I took a picture of it, printed it out, and there was no Ronald Clinton Gibson. You with me so far? <laughs> they claimed that I was a corporate entity, and the state of Oregon states to be a corporate entity have to be registered with the Corporations Commission. I proved to them that I don't exist in their record. Then how can you cite me? Whatever. And then I gave them another little tidbit that strongly suggests that they better drop the case. Because I'm going to come after the officer, I'm coming after the court clerk, and if the judge takes this on and tries to prosecute, I'm going to sue the judge too. Under constructive trust fraud. Because you violated my rights by color of law. They're claiming that I'm a corporation and I proved that I wasn't. It's your choice. What do you want to do, court? That thing's never showed up anywhere. They would not give me a document. They didn't have the guts to send me back that had been dismissed. Because they knew what I'd do with it, because I've I've dealt with them before, let's put it that way. Okay? But I'm just trying to give you the analogy, going back to your question about color of law. It's a big one. I was showing uh, Rex, the document that I have, to have a social security number it is, it is unlawful to have a social security number. I got the documents. It's for federal employees. We are being scammed beyond belief, folks. And my prayer is that you people would, and I say this respectfully, wake up. Because if you don't take a stand, there's an old saying, and I love sayings. It says, if you don't take for stand for something today, tomorrow you will fall for anything. Okay? There's a bumper sticker out. I love it. The bumper sticker said, well, two of them, actually. One of them said, I'm a fool for Jesus. Whose fool are you? I love that. Another one said, if you think there is no hell, you better be right. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I think I want to ask you this question. <laughs> I am so confused about what sovereign means. Okay. And living within the bounds of the reservation, they claim that they are a sovereign nation. They're also a corporation. And now also. the EPA has given them status as a state. Yeah. What does sovereign mean? Very simple, very good question. Let me explain to you as clearly as I know it. A sovereign is God created. Almighty God is sovereign. We, in the book of Genesis, said, it tells us 
let us make man in our image. We're the only creature ever created that is made in the image of Almighty God. That's powerful, folks. That's a true sovereign. We are sovereign in this nation by creation. We are also sovereign by virtue of being our own king, king of our land. We're a child of the king, okay? The Bible tells us that over and over and over. Our problem is we don't recognize that. We don't function accordingly. But a sovereign very simply means that God created. The sovereign nations, they call them that simply because they were a nation of sovereign people by God's creation. God made the Indians. He made the, you know, the Africans, the Canadians, the whatever. But that, to answer your question, is the sovereign, and it's in my book. Ron, do you, yes. do you want the Black's Law Dictionary of Sovereign? Yeah, go ahead. It's real short. Black's Law is a great dictionary to use if you want to know legal definitions. Sovereign, a person, body, or state in which independent and supreme authority is vested. A chief ruler with supreme power. A king or other ruler in a monarch. Beautiful. Thank you very kindly. Did you hear that, what she just said? Of supreme power. What are we talking about about our patent? If you have your land patent brought forward, who's the king of that land? You are. Okay? Are you, are you getting the picture here, folks? We need to rethink what we're doing. You've been indoctrinated. I've been indoctrinated. And I woke up one day and said, wait a minute. I'm going to do everything that I can to be free. I'm willing to support a lawful government and an unlawful government. I'm going to be a pain in their butt forever. Because they're not functioning within the framework of God's intent. There are two elements of law. One of them is the intent of law, and the second part of it is the letter of the law. Our legal system and our legislators, for the most part, have come to the point of the letter of the law. Let's manipulate that. Let's twist. Let's redefine that. Beautiful representation of what you just read about a sovereign. You and I are sovereigns by our creation. God gave man the dominion over the earth. Okay? And we're not doing our job, folks. We're letting a bunch of radicals come and dictate and manipulate government officials and government as a whole. And then we wonder why things are in a mess. We need to get up, look up, get up, and move forward. God said, come and follow me. The psalmist David said, Lord, protect me by standing in front. I love that scripture. So simple, because God is in his rightful place. In front. I do marriage counseling, done it for 30 years. And I get couples there that are at odds with each other and they're battling back and forth and on the wrong track for everything. And I try to get a point to, across to them, and especially with some women that are very strong willed, are not willing to follow their husband's leadership. On the other side, husbands have a godly responsibility to be a loving leader. Ephesians 5 says, Husband, wife, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. A lot of guys don't want to give to their wives. They don't want to take them. They don't want to give themselves for, for her. And I tell the wife and the husband both, pretty difficult for a woman to follow the husband when he's parked alongside the road. If I can use that analogy. Us men have a responsibility to stand up and be leaders and lead your wife and your family in a godly direction. And if you'll do that, God said, I'll oh, bless you and bless you and bless you and bless you. Yes, someone had a, yes, sir. Yeah, so once you finish the whole process and you have your patent. Pardon? Once you have your patent title, you will. How do you, would you talk about inheritance? Uh, how do you, uh, is it taxable? Can the IRS? There's several issues there, but how do you, you're going to die sooner or later. What happens when the person in title 
path and how does where does it go? It goes to the air, just like it says on the so path. Is it probatable? Does no, it... no. Very good question. Probate courts have no jurisdiction over land banks. That's why you don't have to worry about the state milking your estate. That's just a lawful, a legal, excuse me, not lawful, but thievery. I'm helping some people right now with an issue in Wisconsin. Sick what the courts are doing. Thievery, robbery, immoral from start to finish. I'm going to file paperwork for her so she can sue the probate officer and the probate judge. They're robbing that estate with no just cause. Hang on just a second. Yes. Yes. Well, you, oh, um, now, if someone gets the idea of doing putting a conservation easement on this patent, patented land, that doesn't match, and it destroys the patent, doesn't it? That's a contract. Uh -huh. You have the full right and authority to contract. If you do, you dilute your patent. And then, hang on a second. He's putting an affidavit back. We know you just you list the names, the places, the time, and the subject matter is what an affidavit affects. And that one person's signature is sufficient. It doesn't need to be witnessed. Yes, because it's a personal, you can't have an affidavit signed by two people. Because you're not two people. Well, right. But their signature to their statement doesn't need yeah. to be witnessed. Their signature is sufficient. Your signature, right? right. Didn't you say something earlier that uh, an affidavit that goes unchallenged for a period 30 of days. 30 days? 30 days. And then it uh, stands it, forever. Stands forever. If you do an affidavit of that, and you say that's what I did to the Department of Geology, I was telling you a story about my neighbor down there. They wanted to get as far away from me as they could get. But when I sent that last document, they knew. I let them know I'm coming at you. Yes. So you can get your patent finished. I, what's the paperwork you do to uh, send to the county, take a, take you off the pack roll? There's a process to do that. I will provide that to Rex. I don't want to get in that today, only because it's a, a session in itself. It's a very simple document, but it must be done correctly. Okay? But your patent land is not subject to taxes. Yes. It depends upon how it's written. Uh, I've seen some that I can break. I've seen some because the language is that they're for long periods of time. And it depends whether the contract contact uh, content is in fact uh, properly done. A lot of those are done, they're not worth the paper they're written on. And some of them pretty binding. Yes. If you uh, pay tax at after you establish the land tax, does that give them any leverage? If you do what you know? You pay tax, you don't have to, but if you say you don't file the paper, you pay tax. Is that give them some leverage that, that you are sovereign? No, it does not. Because you can pay. You have a right to pay whoever for whatever reason that you want. The fact that they're demanding it from you and trying to force you to pay it is a whole different issue. Okay? Yes? What about commercial enterprise? I'm sorry? Commercial enterprise, if you own land and you want to start a business, are you subject to building codes and licensure? If you're under a corporation, you are because you're under contract. Okay, perfect. I'm only... If you're doing it in your own name and it's patented, then no, you're not. See, the administrative <laughs> process is all of these terms and these, you know, creations of this and that. <clears throat> All that, and I want to be that honest with you, is nothing but to manipulate you to control. That's right. Corporations are fictitious entities. 
They're a creation, a man's creation on a piece of paper. There's no substance to it. It's not like a piece of land with a dirt or trees and there's whatever. You understand the difference? Okay? Yes? Okay, so if your land is under if your land is under patent title, should you have a sign at your boundary of your property that this land is yes. under patent title? Therefore, no one can come on your property right. you without to post, permission. You would have to post that. But if you post that, using the statutes that are applicable to trespass, if we have, I'll tell you what, let's take a 10 minute break and then come back home. And then we'll do our last segment here, okay? Your record, your documents. There's another down at the bottom. It says all requiring recordation of title. Title 18, USC, Chapter 47, Section 12, uh, 1021. You can look those up at your leader. Next page, Title 18, 241. And the real estate lady that was here, I don't know if she's still here or not, but was addressing the issue of what is color of title. This gives you a very good description of what happens when you're representing something of color of title. Okay? First one is conspiracy against right. The second one, Title 18, Section 242, is deprivation of rights under color of law, getting back to this lady's question earlier. Listen to what that says. Deprivation of rights under color of law, whoever under color of any law, statute, ordinance, regulation, or custom, willfully subject any person to the state, territory, commonwealth, possession of the district of de uh, deprivation of any right, privilege, or immunity secured or protected by the Constitution of the laws of the United States, stop. Where does your patent title come from, folks? United States. What did that just say? Constitution, didn't it? Yeah. Okay? You starting to see the protective covenants here? Hope you grasp that. Very important. Protected by the United States. Constitution or the laws of the United States. Okay? How many of you here know what the word, word vested means? Vested right? Back there, a few of you. A vested right, and it's important that you remember this. A vested right means that the right is comes by way of law, L-A-W. Vested right also has the protective covenant <coughs> by law. In other words, for a judge or the state legislatures or some uh, regulatory person that comes along and tries to infringe upon that, There's a federal offense under Title 18, Section 241 and 242. Vested right is protected by law because it is initiated by law. You have to change the law. And it wouldn't matter anyway because the vested right can't be taken away from you. You can't have a pro uh, ex post facto, excuse me, Law, in other words, to go back retroactive and take something away from you. But you're Obama. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It sounds good, but what happens when you get plugged into administrative law and it, that your concept is trumped? Yeah. You call him. <laughs> he didn't hear you. Maybe didn't hear you. That's okay. Right. I want to move on quickly. Work and those people are doing. To the page 134, and I just want to make reference to it. Land pledge is unlawful. There's a number of, of enactments by the United States that pledge your land under a special 
um, collateral for foreign debt, have no authority to do that, unconstitutional to do it, and on and on. You can read for yourself. I want to go to page 138, called Federal Jurisdiction, United States versus Bevin. Very interesting case. Courts establish the principle that federal jurisdiction extends only, only over the areas wherein it possesses the power of exclusive legislature. And this is the principle incorporated into the subsequent decision, recognize the extent of the federal jurisdiction to hold or otherwise would destroy the purpose and the intent of the meaning of, meaning of the entire United States Constitution. Another court case, United States versus Bevin. You saying, what is that saying? It's telling you that they have very, very limited uh, authority and jurisdiction. Okay? I don't know how many people here in Montana have been affected by actions and claims and documents by the EPA or the Forest Service or the BLM. Has no standing. The Supreme Court confirmed that the purpose for acquiring land within the state is limited to defense. In other words, they're redefining here again and also reaffirming this book called the Constitution about the limits of government. That's why this book is so thin. It gives them very, very, yes, ma'am. You gotta ask, uh, what are your thoughts on the Cleffy decision then? I'm sorry. I wanna ask what your thoughts are on the Cleffy decision that seemed to completely subvert all of this. Well, I won't say that there aren't decisions that have come down that contradict that. In those cases, it is specified in many, many court cases that if it's in violation of this, then it's notwithstanding. Is that your question? Yeah, I think Clecky is the one that, that's causing us all the problems. It's a more current right. decision that basically says the federal government can do whatever they want. Well, they cannot do that. I know. I know. And, and especially in your position, you're aware of that. There is in, in the government circles what's called presumption. It's also used in the courts. You're presumed to be something and to be countered. The very point you made about the court case, they're claiming that the government can do anything. Let me see if I have it to give you an example. <clears throat> Somewhere I've got. Oh, anyway. The United States Congress in 1976 implemented an act, an unlawful act that has no standing. And you guys are going to identify with what I'm going to tell you. Have you heard of FLIPMA? Yeah. Yeah. Federal Land Policy Management Act. I can tell you from 45 years of research in law, that enactment is totally unlawful and unconstitutional. What that did, I need to rest my back a minute, is self-proclaim your land to government ownership. They said, we just decided we're going to keep this federal land. Public land. <laughs> you and I know that it's public land, but they're claiming that it's now federal land. Federal means corporate. They cannot go and take what belongs to you, the people. I'm going to ask you the question, why not? What have you learned here today why they cannot do that? I want to have a little test here. No title. 
or free food. Why can they not do it? Because we're the king. Remember we were sharing with you about the issue of treaties? Treaties? All the land acquisitions in the United States came by treaties. Congress and their own cannot annul that treaty. That's why the courts are bound. That's why the constitutional right of ownership of land has been so sacred and so secure for all of these years. They're trying to dismantle it, and that's because we haven't stood up. <clears throat> but to get back to your question, and you pose a very good question, and that is the fact that seems to counter this. It does, as far as the appearance of it. But I can tell you in law, I'm talking about in law now, not within government policy or government intent or whatever. That has no standing, that case. You cannot, by law, encumber your people's land without your consent. Now, having said that, if there was an issue brought up of which they asked you, the people, to vote on, to allow them to do that, now that could be done under that auspices. Why then could it be done under that provision and not the other? Why is that? It's your land. Consent to the government. The Congress is the one that passed that act, the Clinton Act. That's right. So our elected representatives did that too. But they did it in a corporate capacity. They did it in a corporate capacity. They did it under the federal government. You and I are not bound by the corporate rules and regulations unless you will. Remember the city of Dallas versus Metro Cage I read? See, we've been indoctrinated that we're, we're subject to all that stuff. There's an element of law called tacit agreement. That means that you're in agreement by your silence. The passage of that was done not under a constitutional mandate and authority, but it was done under the corporate framework of a color of law Congress. And maybe I said this, I shared this with you before. We do not have a lawful person in our government. The states, when they incorporated absolutely warred against the Constitution. The state of Oregon is a corporation. The state of Montana is a corporation. Then the counties incorporated so they could get money. Then the cities incorporated so they could get money. But all the time the octopus's arms went out and out and out. And they're in but one half of one percent of the people who know or understand what I just said. And I'm not saying that to try to act like a smart aleck. That's not my point at all. You do not have a lawful government under a constitutional republic until you function as a republic. And you voice your vote to the, and your voice through your vote the people who are accountable to you and to that constitutional document. We have people today taking oaths of office and given their oath to uh, obey the Constitution and defend the enemy foreign and, and domestic and then turn around and they violate everything they gave their oath to. And I'm telling you, that's a moral sin. It's as ugly as it comes. It's deprivation of rights under color of law because it is not law it's corporate rules and regulations and we better understand that I got court cases galore that will support that but if you just read your constitution it tells you that the commonwealth of Delaware wrote the first sentence in that because it did not have that originally until it went to be ratified. If you notice the writings on that, 
We the people is tilted the other direction. You look at the document. Go and look at your constitution. I want you to read that document. I want you to memorize the constitution. Get a little packet, put it in your purse, put it in your pocket, and memorize it. Because it empowers you. Knowledge is power. Knowledge properly applied is wisdom. But you have to decide which of the three people are you. You got some movers and shakers in here. And I hope you don't have many people who just watch things happen. And I pray to God there's no one that just wonders one day what happened to our republic. Yes. Would you agree that every sovereign has an unlimited right to contract and that every body has the right to contract their rights away under the Constitution? Yes. Would you also agree that 99 out of 100 people have done that, either yeah. unknowingly or knowingly? But see, that voids the contract. And this lady can tell you, if you do not do a proper disclosure, like in a land sales contract thing, and there is misrepresentation to that, there can be serious consequences with that. At least that is in Oregon, and I'm assuming that is in, in Montana. But would you agree the contract is only void if you void it? by your own declaration. That is correct. You can't accept that. If you don't void it, it's stamped, right? You can void it on the basis that you were not properly informed about what the terms and conditions was of whatever transpired. But if you don't do it, it's stamped. That is when correct. you go into a, an administrative court, they will take silent judicial notice and attack the presumption that you have not voided the contract and they will rule against you 100% of the time. I can guarantee you. That's why I encourage people in many situations to do, and I've got all the documents called revocation of signature. And it's a revocation of signature for cause. And you name what the cause is. I got the template. I'll send them to, to uh, Rex and do an affidavit of citizen uh, of sovereignty, of citizenship of sovereign. There's also been a great debate on the issue about United States citizens. How many United States citizens do we have in here? <laughs> I'm not pointing the fingers. Let me tell you why. Which of the three definitions of the United States are you talking about? <laughs> I'm talking about the present United States. The corporate United States. Okay? Then there is you and some of the publications and stuff you find on the internet. Well, you need to be a state citizen. Well, if you live in the state, you are a state citizen. But your authority and jurisdiction is you that you are an American citizen. Okay? An American citizen. Be careful what you identify yourself with. And I don't mean to be facetious, but can I pick on you a little bit? Is that <laughs> yeah. When you acknowledge by virtue of your voter registration, and you acknowledge by the fact of not doing a revocation on your Social Security, and you acknowledge the fact of your driver's license, and you acknowledge the fact of your zip code, you are confirming that you are a slave to the federal corporation. Sorry to bear that news, but that's a fact of the matter. How do you undo that? Pardon? How do you undo that all? Do revocation of your signature bills. I help the lady do it on that. What do you find? You help the letters? You have a right to travel anywhere in the world being you. That's a God-given right. This binds you to the corporate jurisdiction. And especially with the unlawful and the unconstitutional passage of the Patriot Act. Boy, you talk about trying to gut us from groin to eyeball. That enactment did. But it also is unlawful, yes. So by using a driver's license, a social security number, or being a registered voter, claiming your U.S. citizenship, would you be committing fraud by trying to go for a land patent? No. No. And that, in fact, land patents are only applicable in the true sense of law. 
is having to do with the true sovereign. This lady over here addressed from Black's Law Dictionary what a sovereign is. I've shared with you what a sovereign is. Are you a king of your life? Are you a king of your land? You have to answer that question. Your decision. Yes. All right here, right above the perjury jurat on number six. When a lawfully qualified sovereign American individual has claimed title and count, I would like to know what a disqualified sovereign American individual is. Oh, one, I can know the difference. One who's the corporate subject. When you yield to the corporate jurisdiction, you're sovereignty by virtue of the law, not by creation, but by law, is slid right off the table. So you're going to disqualify yourself from this by using Social Security, contracting with the IRS. Technically, yes. Right. I just did an IRS class in one of the law classes that I'm teaching. Amazing what these people found out with stuff I presented. About 60% of the people sat there with their mouth open. All this IRS garbage does not apply to you. And if we were to do a class on it, I can prove it. Right from the Internal Revenue's own book, it describes who's a taxpayer. It describes what is taxable and what is exempt. Your wages is not taxable. You're saying what? Your wages are not as The reason being is that you're, that's a barter. That's not an income. You've traded what you have for something that somebody else, and the two of you agreed to make that exchange. That is not by the lawful definition or even legal definition. Legal and lawful are different, by the way. The very fact that you do not have an income on that basis, and let alone a taxable income. Okay? That's a whole other subject for another day. But the very point that I'm making to you is that we get sucked into these things. You know a 1040 form is nothing? That's not a legal document? Did you know that? It's a form number of a paper that's printed up. That's all a 1040 form is. When you sign that, you volunteer to pay, and you volunteer to be subject to, and you volunteer to be a debtor. Your power of your signature is mighty, folks. It's mighty. Yes, sir. So, uh, I'm... I'm your son sitting on your couch. And you're you need to speak up a little bit. I'm sorry. I, I'm your I'm your son, and I'm sitting on the couch in our in our living room. And if you were my son, you wouldn't be sitting on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I, I'm sorry. You're you're gonna you know I I got a social security card I'm supposed to sign because I'm 18, and you know I I've got a driver's license. And, you know I'm gonna start to drive. Uh, there's, there's positives and negatives, you know, I, I've been told, you know, you'd never be able to get a job here and there, be able to vote, you never be able to run for office. Can we talk about your advice along sure. the line? I mean, be glad. Yeah. Number one, what I would instruct you if you were my son in that situation, I would send a letter to the Department of Motor Vehicles and I would say, please provide me the lawful requirement for me to have a driver's license if I'm just going to be traveling in my own personal person. Then I would go to the, the uh, Social Security, and I would send them a letter and say, by what lawful authority do, do you have that obligates me to get a Social Security number? And you're going to find some very interesting stuff that's going to come back to you. And I can tell you, none of it is lawful. Okay? Every, it, 
agency or entity of which you think that you're required to apply for, you send them a demand notice. I've learned in law when I go to law school, whenever there is a challenge made to me and to my right under constitutional law, I spin it around. I learned that. It took me about four months to get that through my thick head. And my constitutional professors come up and hit me on the head. She said, have you got it yet? And I said, what am I supposed to get? He said, you put the burden on the opposition. You always put the burden on them. They're demanding something from you, I demand something from you. And I'm not going to comply to yours because I can't until you give me what I demanded from you. Slams the brakes on real quick. And that's what I did to the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. Had another guy helping me with that too. Very sharp guy, sharp, sharp. We have to decide whether we're going to be a slave or we're going to be a king. It's your choice. Okay? So, yes, sir. I'd like to point out that because we have the unlimited right to contract, there's a hundred ways that we contract lawyer sovereignty. And so, because we live in a police state, you have to know what they recognize and they will respect. Because if you don't, and you claim to be a sovereign, and you go into court and you are taking the benefits of the system, they will put you in jail because they will take silent judicial notice that you're cheating, that you want the benefits, but you don't want to pay the consideration. And it's always tied to Social Security number. And That's if right. you don't want to pay the consideration, if you don't want to be under the rules, you can't take the consideration. And so the remedy is to not use a Social Security number to annul it for constructive fraud, to put your declaration of sovereignty in the public record. It stands an absolute fact, and they will respect it under the Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act of 1976. Right. But I have the only way to respect it. That's correct. Right. Otherwise, you will go to jail with your trauma. Well, what they do in those instances, that the proper jurisdiction has not been brought forward, and that's what you're saying. And that's true. That's why you need to learn what you're doing. Doesn't take forever, but build your foundation. Yes, sir. I don't need to shed a negative light on this. Firing, but at the same time, it's the real world. In the real world today, if you go down to Flathead Electric and try and put utilities in your home without a social security, you can't get me. Oh, can't turn on the I have done it numerous times. How do you but, do it? I do it by putting the demand. When they refuse me, then I start telling them with the threat that now I'm going to sue you under Title 18. There's always a remedy. They will not tell you. You have to go and tell them how to do it. They don't want you to know that you have a right to without a social security number, but they won't tell you how. You have to tell them that you want it, and then it works. You can get everything without a social security number. You have to know how, and it is possible. Yes, there, my chiropractor, she, um, her parents were very awake, and they never did the paperwork for her to get a social security number. She does not have one. She's never had one. If she has a letter stating the reasons why or how she did it, but she's a doctor today, and she doesn't have to have, she doesn't do baby even. The important thing she doesn't do is baby even. But she's living on it. I read just a few days ago, wasn't it, Jason, that I read the thing to you about the, the, uh, Social Security number, the, wasn't it you sitting at the table with your dad and I when I read that? You might not remember it, but I have the documents. When they demand a Social Security number, I take my documents there that comes right out of the Code of Federal Regulations, and I said, show me the counter to that. That, says, that law says I'm not allowed to have a Social Security number unless I'm a federal agent on federal business for the benefit of government. If you take one, you become a federal agent and all your business is federal but, and you have jurisdiction. But you don't become a federal, you're presumed to be a federal agent. There's a difference, but I understand the point you're making. Yes? How do you get out from underneath it? Pardon? How do you get out from underneath it? Don't use it. No, but you, you send, 
you send a notice of revocation relative to the Social Security. That's what I did with the driver's license thing. And that applies to everything you do, your driver's license. Well, you have to do it to each agency. So, so yeah. I want to get a not being taxed yeah. anymore. I can do it. Certified mail return receipt request. So what, what happened to those people that are in jail right now? So they don't pay their taxes. What's the What's the difference between the person sitting in jail and you know this guy here deciding to without being taxed? Well, what I would do if they ever did arrest me, I will have some people on the platter. They might arrest me. That can happen. But I'll tell you what, it's going to be the one of the worst things they ever did. Because I know how to come out of it. And I will come out of it. Another question, yes. I rescinded my federal contracts 30 years ago. I uh, paid the IRS what was due and I sold my corporation. $100,000 or so. And they sent me back a bill for four dollars and 34 cents or what it was so i sent them a crisp five dollar bill and a certified letter with the serial number of the bill on there and the dummy sent me back a check for 60 some cents yeah. and i have that today yeah. but i was prepared to testify in Connecticut against the guy i knew so i flew out there and uh the prosecuting attorney wanted to run a make on me before he put me on the stand i asked him to subpoena me so i recovered and he did and so when he went to run a make on me, he asked for my social. I said, I don't have one. He says, everybody's got to have one. I said, listen, I joined the Navy with a, with a uh, military service number, not a social number. And I said, but everybody has a date of birth, and I have one too. Would you like that? So he ran a make on me and come back, and he said, who the hell are you? I had, uh, right off NCIC, there was no social security number on there, and it said file closed. Yeah. And that came from the FBI. I, said, I, know it works. I know it works, but there's a price you pay for not having it too. Well, but you have to make your decision. Are you going to be a slave yeah. or I want to say, and I think you folks already know, this process is not easy, and it's not without its lumps and bumps. And again, you have to decide what it is that you want to do. You want to bring your land back and forward, tremendous benefit, but there is a setback. You can't get a mortgage loan or the people are going to buy it. I want you to know that. If you do a land patent and there is somebody to challenge, you may have to defend it in court or have somebody defend it for you. Like I said earlier, the Constitution is not a self-executing document. How many of you are familiar with Gideon in the Bible, the story of Gideon's army? I believe in my own heart that that's what God is asking to be brought up in what I do. And I'm not saying that to pat me on the back. That's not even the issue. But I'll tell you something I have found and I shared with Rex and his son, Jason, and also <clears throat> with uh, this gentleman here, I'm trying to think of his first name. But it's amazing God has brought Peter, pardon? Oh, no. Joel, thank you. Sorry about that. But God has surrounded me with some incredible people. I prayed about it, and all of a sudden they start showing up. And I'm going, wow, where did you come from? Oh, I heard about you there. I'm trying to do this. I've got to sit down with that. I bet. <clears throat> And God keeps blessing. And I feel that what I do is at the direction and the guiding hand of the Lord to come and share with you what it is that I have to offer. And so I just want to mention that <clears throat> you have to make your own decision here. I want to open this up for additional questions of anything that you'd like to ask. Whatever, we've got about 45 minutes or maybe a little less. We've got to be out of here by five. Is there any questions? If not, I've got some more stuff I can cover. Whatever your pleasure is. Yes. I'm sorry. Could you use a contract for deed? 
if you wanted to sell your property and then people could not finance. Mm, yes. Okay. yes. You should do it for sale by owner then. Yeah. And transfer them. Right. <clears throat> right. Yes. When they decide to sell it and uh, people want to do a mortgage, so the, the land patent is pointed at that point. And but what can the succeeding um, buyers of that property, can they go back and use the information and re reinstate a, another transaction yeah. with the information that was in the What was the question? All it takes, can you repeat the questions? Would that be okay? Pardon? Can you repeat the questions? Would that be okay? Yeah. Because we can't pick them up here. That'd be oh, okay. okay. Thank you. The question that she asked was, if in fact a seller wanted to sell it, correct me if I'm wrong here, and they had to convert it back to a warranty deed, and the person, the party bought it, could they use the same information and then reestablish the land patent position? The answer to that is yes. What, what determines whether you can do that or not, you have to be the owner of record. Okay? That's like anybody in your chain of title could have done the same thing had they known or chose to do it. Yes? Does your status as far as sovereign or not affect the land patent process? Yeah, say the question again. Your status. Like, for instance, I'm currently a slave to the state. Okay. Can I still get a land patent for my piece of property? Now, define to me what your definition of slave is. I'm under contract with the United States Marine Corps. I'm in contract with the federal government for various things, social security number, banking, all those things. Um, sure. I have signed away all those rights. Right. But can I still possess a land patent and be protected by in-law or by lawful. Yes. So because I you're a sovereign. You're sovereign by creation. Sovereigns can bring forth land patents. There are other supportive elements that would be a little bit of a, a problem. But as long as you're listed as the owner of that property, then you could bring the land patent forward. So as a follow-up, in that position, I have a land patent, <clears throat> but at the same time, I've entered into contracts. Would I then be obliged to pay taxes and yes. and do yes. those things on the property? Yes. And that's where those all those other people get in trouble. That's it's, correct. Okay. Yes. yes. I just wouldn't forget you. Go ahead. Back on the, the notice, the front page of the hat sandwich, page one eighteen, number three. Has some language in there that says uh, the patent, which is legally authorized to be executed in pursuance of the supremacy of the treaty law. Can you just explain that a little bit more? Like what you mean by that treaty law? What treaty law are you speaking of? Okay, treaty law is specific to all treaties, and land was acquired by the United States government by way of treaties. You heard treaty between the Indians, you know, treaty between uh, France and England, and we got Russia's property on a purchase, but that included a treaty as well. The treaty brings with it the authority and jurisdiction because it's a conveyance of land outside of our system into our system without encumbered system. You with me? Without encumbrance. Oh, no, without encumbrance. Okay. And so that authority and jurisdiction relative to treaty law allows the recipient of a land patent of which to have all the rights, title, and interest, and anything and everything having to do with that land patent belongs to you. Now, I'm going to make it real simple, best that I can. 
That land patent is just not an issue of getting you a piece of land. There are other things that you inherit with that through the treaties. And the treaties have to be honored by our form of government. That's why we have Article 6, Clause 2. And it binds the courts. The courts are the ones who are supposed to be the determination, determinators of law. Not the determination of, but the determinant of law. And in through that treaty, authority and jurisdiction binds those judges to never, ever interfere in their court proceedings that infringes upon that right and that property. Because not only do you get property, but you get rights with the property. Does, does that kind of in the direction of the question, or were you so that I understand clearly your point? Well, I still don't quite understand it. I mean, I understand what the Constitution says, but, it's, but under treaty law, you're talking about the land that was acquired by the United States government from like, right. this area, the, the Native Americans in the treaty of 1955? That right and entitlement to that land can never be, be diminished. It cannot be altered. Because in the treaties, if you go back and you read the treaties, that in essence it states that that land is conveyed to the United States on behalf of the people, not the government as the entity of government. They're the holders of that land and title and interest and authority and jurisdiction on your behalf. So that's why the treaties are mentioned in that particular portion of the document. Treaties have tremendous power. And treaties and flags are honored worldwide. You've heard the law of the flag, you've heard the law of treaty, the law of nations, all that. The law of nations and the treaty goes clear back into scripture. When that treaty is ratified and there's a conveyance of property, property does never goes by itself. It always comes with the authority and jurisdiction that it accompanies that. That the treaty, the person conveying that to, relinquishes that over. That's the whole concept of the patent. When you do, you get everything. When you convey a patent to the next person, you are giving away not only the land, the disposing of the land, but to the authority and jurisdiction to the recipient of that. So, and I don't know if I've answered your question. I'm trying to do the best that I can and best that I understand your question. Because treaties have power is what I'm trying to say. And in that power of the treaty, then in essence, that goes wherever that land goes. That same full power, it's never diminished. That's why you always get authority and jurisdiction as well as the land. That's what I'm alluding to there in that document. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. Yes. How is the land conveyed from one to another? It's, how is it conveyed from the government to us? No, or from, from the sovereign to another sovereign. Okay. It's done by a grant. You draft up a document and then you call it, you can call it a land grant. You can call it a, a land conveyance grant. Number of titles you can put up, but you can just put grant as your heading. And that grant, I, Ron Gibson, do hereby convey and grant all rights, title, and interest from me, Ron Gibson, to him, Jack, and Joe on this day. But, I mean, I'm being very simplistic. Right. That's how you do it. You have, you cannot sell the land. You cannot buy the land. Right. Land in a true form to, to from soiling, if I can put it in that context, the land patent, it needs to be granted. And you can what? sell the trees, you can sell the grass, if you're getting monetary payment for something, but you're given the land. Buy the building, buy the shed, buy the barn, whatever. Now, once that is granted, does it need to be uh, recorded? Pardon? Does it need to be recorded? 
Yes. Yes. Now, the recipient of that in a land patent situation always has the burden to record. And your conveyance to another sovereign is not complete until it is uh, conveyed. Okay? Just making sure we had that process. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. The, can we poke a little more on the treaty issue? Pardon? Can we poke a little more on this treaty issue? Sure. For instance, France and the treaty uh, versus the treaty with the uh, with the Indian tribes here. Is there a difference? Is there a difference in purchasing? Is there a difference in the treaties? In the treaties, yes. as far as the value, the the uh, how it would affect us? As no, our, no, it is not. It all goes into the trust pool on that, and it has the land and the authority and the jurisdiction. That all starts out even, Stephen, all the way across the board. Very good. Thank you. Yes. Yes, in the event of uh, so called con con and we change some of the constitution and there's always that threat that we're talking about happening, um, how would that or would it affect our land patents and also treaty law? Will the treaty law supersede a new constitution? Yes, the treaty law does supersede the lesser of value, the second constitution. The second constitution is the color of law. Yeah. It's not the original. It's representative being something that it's not. One little word that was changed in our constitution. The original one, go look it up in the internet if you want. Says for the United States of America. That's the organic, the real McCoy. And they substitute one little word, put all of them, please, before. Change a whole lot of stuff. Yes. This, uh, the national monuments that have become rampant and they extended to two and a half million acres in Montana. Uh, is there a way to stop that and turn that around or yes. is there control it? Yes. Very good question. The question was, with all these monuments and land withdrawals on there, on this very morning, morning coming in, one of my researchers called him. I'm doing, having him doing some work. And he got, I had him go back and pull up the Wilderness Act. I want to encourage you to go read the Wilderness Act. There is a requirement of that, uh, that uh, uh, Wilderness Act that has been violated since day one. Here's what they did. Okay. In 1960, they implemented, I believe in 1960, the Wilderness Act. Four. Fifty-four. And in spite of all of the, the good intentions, once bureaucrats got the thought and that they would have power and the environmental movement was getting started. One of the requirements, and I believe it's under number four, was that there had to be a mineral survey that was done on all lands and within all proposed wilderness areas. They never did the mineral survey. And you're saying, well, why would they have to do a mineral survey? Remember earlier today, I addressed HR 365 with you, which is the 1866 mining law. You remember that? Yeah. That mineral has already been disposed, granted to every one of you and I. Congress has no authority to redispose already disposed land. And if the states were to get the land back, and there's a provision to do that, I'm not sure that they'll do it correctly, and I'm not being critical, but there's a process, a right way to do that. And that is on the basis that the United States government violated the uh, Enabling Act with the state. 
They did not. It's, it's called uh, a bridge, a contract. Okay? And in doing so, then that obligation to relinquish that, the states can claim that back. I've got a book at home written by a good friend of mine, uh, Robert Hill, and it's called Statehood. I want to encourage you to get that book called Statehood. He lays down very clearly the fundamental issues why the states have a right to get that land back. All of the Western states have that right. Because yeah. Congress violated it all. The author again? Pardon? The author again? Uh, Hill. H-I-L-L. -L. I want to go back to the wilderness issue for a moment. It states in the Wilderness Act that in fact all the proposed lands have to have a mineral survey before. And the reason being, they cannot tie up a land that's already be predisposed relative to the mineral estate. So what does the government do? They went, well, would you like to tie this land up and spend all this money? Do you realize how much money it costs to tie up land and the upkeep of that in the paperwork? Far more than if they let production come off of that land. There's a requirement of which the United States government said the Federal Bureau of Mines was to do a mineral survey before they could implement or pass an enactment having to do with tying up area for a wilderness area. Yes, so what they did, they just obliterated the Federal Bureau of Mines. Oh. And then they said, we don't have anybody to do the survey. So they just went in and did it anyway. And we sat there, some of us really screamed an olive oil. And as soon as we're financially able, I'm the chairman of what's called the Jefferson Mining District. Mining district, largest mining district in the United States. And we get very, very heavily involved in land uh, issues and in government proposals uh, having to do with our public land. We drive them crazy. And I don't know if I shared with you. She had a question. Excuse me. I just, yes, ma'am. I just wanted to add on uh, the end of the National monuments are signed by, uh, based upon the signature of the president alone, and it's part of the Antiquities Act that was supposed to be nothing more, much more than a battlefield. Exactly. So, do, does the minerals uh, requirement apply there? Or yes. The mineral requirement is on all land being proposed for withdrawal. That means wildernesses, that means uh, <laughs> monument areas, that means study areas wildlife preserves, all of that stuff. Yes? Are there any wilderness areas that they have done this study? Pardon? Are there any wilderness areas that they have done that? Have they done the mineral survey? They did two. <coughs> so what are one of them is a Coneopolis, down where I live, and one of them is in Alaska. The only two. Them. Yeah, they did it on the, the still water too, down in Nevada. Yeah. But they recommended that they drop it and Congress won't drop it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I just got a question on the land patents again, and I'm a little confused about the mineral rights going with the land patent. <coughs> the mineral rights don't always necessarily go with it once you get it. That is correct. That's why you can tell, if I'm understanding your question, the land patent then in essence has a reservation on it. You may not get the mineral. Is that am I hearing you correctly? Well, yeah, I just yeah, I mean I don't well, do we get the mineral or don't we? Would it be listed in there? Yes. Whether it goes with it or not. How you tell whether there's a mineral that goes with the land patent if it does not have a subject to clause on it. Whenever there is mineral that is known, the applicant for a land patent, they had to declare whether in fact there was mineral in character. Now that created a little bit of problem because a lot of those people were only farmers, they weren't miners, they didn't identify what 
it was a mineral or was it not? What was it? So what they did, they went and got somebody who did know that helped them to make that determination. Because if you apply for a patent and it was mineral in character and the, the general land office found out that you're your patent, you lost it. So then he loses five years of hard work, sweat, and money. So when the noble decision came down to address that issue, it really straightened up the land patent issue. And it's glad that they did. Because the mineral estate was designed to be kept separate. That's why there's a mining law. Mining law is not one of many laws. It's set above and apart for a very particular reason. Or reasons, if you will. Yes? Is, is mineral, uh, oil and gas, is that considered mineral? I'm sorry. Can oil somebody... and gas, is that considered mineral? Yeah. Oil and gas oh, are yeah. mineral. Yes, they are. But they're what's called leasable minerals. You have three categories of mineral. You have uh, uh, valuable mineral deposits, which is called, we call them locatable minerals. You have uh, disposable minerals, that can be like an aggregate pit or petrified wood or whatever. Those are known as uncommon, uh, they're a common variety. And the locatable minerals are common. And then we have leasable minerals. The leasable minerals comes in most predominantly, not exclusively, but with, in fact, uh, your oil and gas leases. They used to be under the locatable, but then when it finally realized to the government that, man, there's going to be a lot of wealth in this, and they wanted to free deposit on it, so then they pulled that back, and then they kept that to lease. So whenever you do a lease on the, uh, an oil or gas thing, you're dealing with the government. Yes? So water isn't considered a lease item? Pardon? Water wouldn't be, subsurface water wouldn't be considered part of Part of those leased items? Though? I'm not sure I understand the nature. No way, you said oil and gas is typically subservient, but so is water, so, but it's not considered in that category. I know, it's water, not oil. Right, I understand. That's the reason, simply because it's a petroleum based product. There's water with oil, but it's not part of the equation as far as what's being leased. But it's not considered a mineral. No. Well, it is in practical composition, but not in the in the context that we're talking about here. Yeah. Everything on Earth is a mineral of some type. Except you. Okay. It's an element. Yes. Quickly. Well, what's the difference between uh, um, decat and uh, and an allotment? An allotment usually has a time period or condition on it. Uh, you're talking about a land allotment? Yeah. Most of those allotments have what they call restrictive covenants to it. In other words, they're usually designed for a specific purpose or the intent of use is for a specific purpose. And so that's why, that's why they call it like a grazing allotment. Just to give you an example, it may not be kind of in the context that you're, you're referring to. But a grazing allotment has limitations to it. Distance, the number of cattle, maybe how long in the year that you can put the cattle on, like the Bundy situation. And I've studied a lot about the Bundy thing. Uh, the government doesn't own that land. Just to spit it out. Does that answer your question? No, it's more of a tribal allotment from the federal government to a tribal member. Okay. But in what context? Well, in the context of selling it to somebody else, and underneath is a fee patent, or underneath is an allotment. Right. What's the difference? Well, you said there, first of all, there are numerous types of allotments. So without seeing an example, if you please, kind of hard for me to answer that. The allotment is in the sense that instead of you owning it fee simple, then in essence, we're going to allow you to have that land or to use that land with condition <coughs> or for a time period, which is a condition. 
or whatever may be affiliated with that. Allotments can always be pulled back. A patent cannot. And I guess to separate the two from the context of I understand your question. A land patent, once it's done in the two-year period, expands. it stands forever. An allotment can be a month, a year, two years, five years, whatever the term of the conditions are. Okay? Thank you for the question. Hang on a second. Yes? Can you expand on eminent domain in regard to the land patent, you know, uh, highways, uh, high transmission lines, those types of things? Eminent domain means that the government can come in and in essence condemn the land. It's called a compensatory taking. But in an eminent domain claim, they have to pay you. That's what you're protected with under the Fifth Amendment. They have to give you due compensation. That's allowed by the Constitution for the betterment of the public good. And that's been honored for the most part until the last, about the last 30 years. And then all of a sudden our government people began to be more greedy and wanted more power. So they wanted to take more land and been a real fight. So when the people stood up, then they start sending their agencies to do the dirty work. Anybody recognize the EPA? Yeah. The Forest Service? BLM? DEQ? Whatever. They were used as the hatchet men to go out there in the government. We don't know what they're doing. Our congressmen in our district got their butts blistered over the issue of not putting their agencies in under control. The congressman says, and I quote, we don't have any control over them. Bull crap. They're the agency that created, or the entity that created the agency. Okay? It's by Congress directive. They gave them authority, whatever that is. How many of you know what a revised statute means? Why isn't it just statute? They made a revision. <laughs> In Oregon, we have a gentleman that sits at the Salem, and when the legislator makes a law, it's sent to this gentleman, and he manipulates it to fit the particular agenda. That's why it's called a revised statute. It is not what the legislator enacted, and it's totally fraudulent, it's totally contrary to law, but the general public doesn't know about it. Makes you kind of mad, doesn't it? Many of the legislative enactments are very good enactments. And the intent in the most instances is that. Once in a while they get popped off by, oh, what do you call the people there that go in and try to persuade them? Lobbyists. Lobbyists. Lobbyists, thank you. My mind went blank there. But a true legislator will get out in their district and they will talk to the common person. And that's not done near enough. And I know there's a lot of demand on their time. But I don't think you can be a good legislator without doing that. And find out what the will of the people is. And you folks need to stand up and say, hey, Here's what I would like you to address. But when you do that, in respect of your legislator, make it so it's not a personal thing for just my benefit. Is it for the benefit of the majority? That's what a constitutional republic is supposed to do. But there's too much special interest. There's way too much money involved. There's too much corruption in it. And the only way you're going to fix it is to elect people with a godly heart and then monitor what they do. How many of you have seen the movie Goldie Hawn called Protocol? About 
30, 40 years ago. You need to watch that movie. Kind of comical, you know, Goldie Hawn. But I'm telling you, she gets mixed up in government. And when she finds out what's going on, she addresses them, and I love her speech. And she says, and I quote, from now on, I'm going to watch you like a hawk. Because she saw the crap that went on behind the scenes. You and I have that civil and moral responsibility to select good representatives and to get them in positions to do things for the betterment of all of you. But you also have a responsibility to monitor what they do. And a good representative is not afraid to stand up and say, hey, man, I blew it. But you need to support them. <coughs> Give them the support and let them know you're supporting them. So there's some good ones out there. There's some real horses behind us, too. And I'm honored to have you here today. Thank you for coming. Thank you. We've got about five minutes or so. I want to finish. Hang on, just hold your hand. Yes, ma'am. Just a quick question. What do you post on your property then? What time, what does the sign state? Once the lamp patents is Very good question. The question was, what kind of no trespassing sign do you post? You post on that, that this land is hereby posted by virtue of the power and authority of a land patent. Don't worry about using your state uh, uh, statutes to do that. They don't have the authority in the jurisdiction that your patent does. Can you repeat that? And is this land, this property, however you want to define it, is posted and protected by a valid land patent. While we have a moment, let me, did I answer your question, ma'am? Yes. Yeah. I want to pick one more question, then I want to read you something. Yes. I did, when you mentioned the quote where you can have a land patch and one of you business on your land or your ranch, uh, you said don't put it on our corporate structure because it's personally under your own name. Then what if you get into ways if you want to do a ministry or if you want to do a bank or do a ranch, that you have to put under you can do that without it being incorporated. Or you can create a corporation and lease that right by contract. You understand what I'm saying? Ron, Ron it's that because the land patent secures it against uh, uh, a lawsuit. Yes, yeah. with, with, so, yes. So it, can, it cannot be attacked. It cannot be attacked. So if somebody twists their ankle or puts a uh, nail through their thumb working for him, they can't sue him for uh, personal injury. He can sue him, they can't affect the land. Correct, okay. The land is what is immune from attack. We're subject to attack because if we create a damage, that's common law. There has to be a victim. If you have a victim, then in essence, there's liability. Yes. So I understand the personal liability that you're going to assume that you put it back in your name or during the course of what happened. But then if you create a corporation uh, to a lot of business, aren't you now back in contract with the government? No, because the business doesn't own the land. That only affects that if the corporation is a landowner. You can function as a corporation and do anything that you want to do. Well, what about building codes? Let's say you want to build a building on that land, but it's a corporation. If you let the landowner build a building, it's not subject to that. Even if they're one and the same. Pardon? Even if the landowner is also the owner of the corporation, they're one and the same. Uh, I need to think about that a bit, okay? I've not run across that specifically. Look in your book under your index in the front, and go to the trespass deal. I don't remember right now what page it does. 145. The 145, thank you. 
I want us to read this before we depart tonight. <clears throat> Michigan jurisprudence has never recognized immunity on behalf of a city, village, township, county, or any administrative division, therefore, from liability for trespass on private property. Whether the trespass be for a long or short duration, and then it gives a court case there. Next paragraph down, the Fourth Amendment authorizes a person to play his position as a proprietor of a business other than one who progressively re uh, regulated, such as uh, trafficking of alcohol, liquors, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, to bar the governmental agencies from including inspections, carrying out police power, functions to protect public health and safety from his property, gives a court case. Common law and constitutional principles of government of sovereign immunity have never permitted government agents to commit trespass in violation of property rights. Hello? Gives a court case. Osborne versus Bank of the United States, last paragraph. Under the Federal Tort Claims Act, Similarly, federal law enforcement officers are generally enjoying absolute immunity from tort liability, may nonetheless be held liable for damage for tort of trespass. Black versus Sheridan Corporation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Accordingly, the plaintiff's complaint facially pleads a viable case of action for trespass as a constitutional tort. So they're, they're individually responsible. Law enforcement officers can be held individually responsible for breaking the law. Yeah. I'm sorry, I lost the last part of that. So speak up loudly. The law enforcement uh, agents agency is not held liable. The individual law enforcement people are held liable. That's correct. That's why whenever you have a lawsuit against a public employee, you want to sue them under what we define in law as a separate cover. The individual. That drags them out by their hair, if you please, of being defended by your tax dollars. And it's designed to do that. They have to pay for their own attorney, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Folks, I want to thank all of you what a wonderful group you have been and are. Uh, this includes our patent class. For those of you who like, we're going to go get a place to eat tonight. We'd like to welcome you all to visit some more questions that you may have, whatever. So uh, I want to thank you all for a wonderful group you are. Thank you.